Today, we're going to be talking about everyone's favourite 2010 detective show written by a man also known for his work on Doctor Who. Yes, we are talking about Neil Cross's Luther, the first series, the six episodes that ran in 2010. Luther is, of course, a crime show, a psychological crime thriller starring Idris Elba in the title role, with this first series also featuring the equally fantastic Ruth Wilson and another Doctor Who connection in featuring Paul McGann. Showrunner Neil Cross's Doctor Who connection is that he wrote two episodes for the 2013 series, The Rings of Akaten, Clara and the Eleventh Doctor's first big space adventure together, and Hyde, Clara and the Doctor dealing with a haunted house in the 1970s. So I am joined by two friends to discuss Luther Series 1 today. I'm Neo from Australia, and I'm joined by Tyler from England and Tom Tit, also from Australia. And the setup of this is that this was my very first time watching any episode of Luther. So all I have seen are the six episodes of Series 1, and I've been lucky enough to avoid any spoilers at all for the four series after this or for the film, so I am the newcomer here. However, both of my friends here are Neil Cross fans, and a big part of why I've ended up watching the show. So, Tyler has obviously seen the whole show, so he's re-watching it while I am watching it for the first time, and our discussion today will just be about Series 1, nothing from further on. Tom Tit has his own different relationship with the show than both of us, but I'll start with asking Tyler, what's your relationship to Luther the show, and to Neil Cross the showrunner in general? Well, I'd like to clarify that... I would use the term fan loosely. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't utterly love Neil Cross. Um, I do think, however, that Luther is excellent. I, I do genuinely think that Luther the show, despite its low points, that I, I do believe there are, I think that it's great. Uh, I got into Luther when it first began uh, in 2010. Um, this has got to be like the sixth time that i've rewatched it i think i've, I've been pestering you Neo, for a while yeah to yeah. um to give it to, to give it a go yeah i think it's great i think neil cross however uh i've tried a couple of a couple of his other admittedly the, the more recent so i haven't looked far back into his um into his tv and i understand that he's written novels as well so i haven't looked too far back into his works but his more recent stuff i've really not enjoyed hmm. so it's disregarding the dodgy season four of luther i i think that you know this, this is a really fantastic series but everything else appears that i've seen i can't say that i'm a fan of, of neil cross that's good that's interesting so we don't have a diehard adherent kind of perspective coming from you it's more specific to this show itself yeah absolutely okay Tom Tit, what's your relationship with Luther, the show, and Neil Cross then? Okay, well, I watched it like a few years ago. I can't put a precise date on it, but basically like The Rings of Akaten and Hyde, famously a, a double bill from Series 7 of Doctor Who. They're sort of like two of my pet episodes of that show. Um, the mm. Rings of Akaten really made me feel um, seen as an atheist, uh, really spoke to my sort of ambivalence towards God and deities. And Hyde, well, um, I don't know, I just thought it was cute the way the, the two disgusting tree monsters at the end fell in love. <laughs> so I was really, I thought they were really cool. So I thought I'll check out this Luther show. And um, I have a real, I, I guess I'd say a love-hate relationship with it. Like there are bits, there are elements of it that I find really compelling and cool. And there are elements of it that I find really pat and uh, very cliche. And I sort of, my, my interest in the show plateaued towards the end of season three. And to this day, I have not seen beyond that. And I think I can pin that down to the absence of a certain element, a certain character. I think people who have seen the show will probably know what I'm talking about, but I don't know, because I know you haven't gone to that point, Neo. <laughs> so I don't want to spoil it exactly. But yeah, there's a, a certain element which was lacking from season three, which I missed from the first two seasons. So, But I am going to pick up where I left off and watch the rest of it now. I think this is good. We've got a nice little cross section. We've got someone who's seen all of it, someone who's seen like half-ish of it and someone who's just seen the start of it. I think that's a good little section of people we have to discuss it. A real broad church, you could say. <laughs> Very much so. Luther is one of the best dramas you're going to see uh, in recent times. And, you know, and that sounds a little bit uh, full of myself, but I'm really, really proud of it. And I want you to, to, to understand that we put our hearts and soul into this production. Uh, the last thing before we get into the episodes themselves, I'd be interested if either or both of you could just give a sort of general comment or description on why you think the show is interesting or why this first series at least might be worth watching for people because 
I mean, whatever you did worked on me, so I'm interested in how you might describe that. What's interesting about the show? So I've looked into the way that Neil Cross was speaking about the show, you know, back in the day when it, when it was first on its way out. And something that he constantly highlights is he will talk about the, the distinction between uh, the Luther character as both Miss Marple and um, Philip Marlowe. Yeah. Who wrote the Marlowe detective? Uh, Raymond Chandler. Yeah, Chandler. Yeah. So he's, so he's talking about the, the Christie and Chandler stuff. Uh, and the kind of Sherlock Holmes and Columbo stuff. Mm. So he's, he's so his his main thing was the idea of marrying traditional British detective literature with you know a, a, an analytical mind with the traditional American detective literature, where they they have an over emotional response, overly emotional response to the crimes that they're having to sort of solve. Um, so that's that's Neil Cross's take. I approach writing Luther with really a sense of terror and dread and sleeplessness and shaky hands. What the BBC asked me to do was to create an iconic police officer, an iconic detective. Roads of history are littered uh, with the corpses of iconic detectives past and finding something new and vital and, and never told before was, was quite a, it was a difficult thing to ask. Luther is Neil Cross's first series and as such it's a huge, huge thing for him because he's writing all six episodes. He's written novels before and he's written episodes of Spooks before but this is a mammoth undertaking. This is absolutely his creation and his voice and I think that's what's so exciting about Luther the series is it, it has an authored feel to it and I think that's something that we don't often see on British television. I got the idea for Luther because I've spent my lifetime watching and reading detective fiction. Now in crime fiction there are two broad genres. Uh, one is the mystery genre, the puzzle solving genre, and that's where uh, it tends to be a genius detective, a lone maverick or an eccentric. He puts together puzzles, solves mysteries through the accumulation of clues that only he or she can see. And this is the uh, the tradition really best exemplified by people like Sherlock Holmes or Miss Marple. The second tradition it involves a much more morally committed, much more beaten and bruised central heroic figure, best exemplified by Raymond Chandler's Philip Marley. What I've never seen was a character who exemplified both of these primary traits, a character who was as eccentric and as brilliant as Sherlock Holmes, but as morally dangerous as Philip Marley. The way that I presented it to Neo as a fan of Doctor Who was that I I sort of see this as a sister sh show to Sherlock in a way because it was running at the same time, often doing a lot of very similar and I believe accidentally very similar things. And I compared it to Torchwood in that sense, where although Torchwood was um, running alongside Doctor Who and they were, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, this, that it was that they were co-opting and having been uh, commissioned by Russell T Davies and then. Uh, show ran by Chris Chibnall that they would have been in in constant communication, but Moffat and and Neil Cross would not have. Yeah. Despite this, it seems to run quite smoothly in conjunction with each other in the same way that Sherlock and Doctor Who do, for example, or Doctor Who and Tortured do. So I find that really interesting, and I think it's a if you're going to if you haven't seen Sherlock or Luther before, I do recommend pairing them up and watching them kind of fit their their grooves together i find that really fascinating yeah i really like that contemporary aspect like it's so interesting that these two shows coming out of doctor who writers came out in the very same year and both had from what i understand not having seen sherlock somewhat similar aspects in some regards but getting quite different receptions and of course one really blew up uh, and the other like Luther's popular, like I, I heard of it even back in 2010, but it's not a cultural force the way Sherlock is. I think eventually digging into that is going to be interesting. But Tom Tit, what do you think is interesting about the show? Why do you think series one might be worth it for some people? Okay, well, if I were to sell it on a very like lizard brain sort of basis, I would just say Idris Elba and it's just the perfect alchemy between actor and role. Like mm. it's it's a little bit like when an action star will just have a vanity role written for them where they're really cool and, you know, wear cool sunglasses and clothes and they say cool things. Except Idris Elba actually has, like, massive ability and this character is, like... Yeah. Like, if I were... Intense doesn't really cover it. Like, he's so sort of mercurial and it's, like, a, an actor's dream as a character because everything that's going on in his mind, he's not really good at keeping it hidden. It's all sort of on the surface. And so he has all these, like, ticks and it's just, like, supernatural 
I mean, it is super natural. It is also super natural. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's so good to watch. I think he's also listed as an associate producer. So yeah, it is like his, it's his thing. Um, but if I were to go on a more like uh, analytical level, I'd say that it's interesting because it's a detective show that often goes very sort of metaphysical in ways yeah. that I think can be a little bit vague, but nevertheless, it keeps things um, more interesting than the you know average procedural. When people are talking about like abstract concepts of good and evil and matter and antimatter and you know is there love in the world and sort of the addition of a psychopath who is just in the show as a sort of signifier of you know abandoning moral principles rather than as a actual threat to pursue she's almost just she just waits in the wings that's really interesting and um the way it approaches genre i think is pretty interesting as well like it's basically a i see it as a sort of noir with metaphysical elements and it sort of turns the landscape of london into a very noir sort of playground and i didn't know that thing that tyler said about um the fusion of american and british detective yeah. fiction I didn't know that before, and I'm sort of surprised because I don't really see much Britishness in the way this is written. I sort of put this together with, like, Peaky Blinders as basically an attempt to take a very American uh, form, in this case the detective story, in that case the gangster story, and sort of pin it on a London or Birmingham setting. Um, I don't know. I'm not a Brit myself, so you probably have a different perspective on this than me. But um, the... The main thing in Luther that I see as being very sort of British in its DNA is the scenes that take place between Luther and Alice where they're just sort of waxing lyrical with each other because that to me feels like a very like uh, sort of like a romance novel where it's the sort of uh, erotically charged battle of wits between, you know, a, a dangerous sort of Byronic hero and a, and a dangerous woman. Um, it's sort of like very novelistic in the way it plays out. But the actual structure of the show feels quite American to me. Uh, I don't know. But it basically works. I'm not sure it would work without Idris Elba. But, yeah, that's sort of my take on it. Am I remembering right that you have read some of his novel work? Whereas uh, Tyler, I haven't so far. I don't know how much Tyler has. I've only read the Luther novel, which is the prequel. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it quite a lot. We'll get to that eventually. Yeah. Yeah, Idris is a huge part of why I like the show too. I got really into him in... I got into The Wire the year that the final season ran. So that ran from 2002 to 2008. And I thought he was really fantastic in that. And I think that was his first really major role where people really started noticing him in a big thing. So yeah, a huge fan of him. And he does... You're, he's so wedded to this role. It's such a... I can't imagine it without him in it. He's he's so perfect for it. And I think part of that is another thing I really like about the show, which is I think Tom pointed out the noir aspects really well, but I think there's also a big comic book kind of aspect to the show in its realisation of London and its realisation of Luther himself. There's this kind of embracing of the heightened aspect of this sort of crime stuff that Cross is writing. And I like that it feels so different to so much crime or detective fiction that I often bounce off in the kind of veneer of realism it presents, which I don't really like. But for this show to take itself in such a heightened way and be sort of openly genre and openly comic book about it, I found that really invited me in uh, and it endeared me to having engagement and fun with a lot of its concepts where I might not have if they'd been played a lot more straightly, perhaps. Tyler, does that, does that make any sense to you, the idea I'm throwing around there? Yeah, totally. And this is something also that I've read Neil Cross addressing the style that Neil writes in is quite heightened. It's not realism. The characters are all slightly theatrical and everything is pushed to the extreme. John Luther is not going to deal with six psychopaths in the space of three months. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's, it's very extreme and everything's pushed to the edges of it. So it's actually more theatrical than you would get in normal TV dramas, I think. And the characters are slightly bigger than life in that respect. One doesn't necessarily have to worry about every beat of authenticity in the way that one might, for example, in a show like The Wire. The thing with Luther, it's not a police procedural. And so what Neil's always said when people have said, oh, but somebody wouldn't actually do that, is he's right. He's, you know, working within Luther world and it's quite a heightened world. And what you need to feel is that you're invested in what he's doing because he's doing it for right. I did actually go into the script a couple of times when we were, while, while we were re-watching this. I've noticed that a lot of what 
uh, Cross does for his sort of world building uh, setting thing. I guess this is because he's a novelist and not so much, of, or at this time, I guess, not so much of a screenwriter. Uh, understanding written bits of uh, Spooks. I think he'd actually gone on to show show run Spooks for the last six season or two or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure exactly how much screenwriting work he'd had before that, but he's a very um, novelistic screenwriter. Uh, and so a lot of the uh, descriptions of certain settings will include words such as uh, wasteland uh, or forsaken. Um, and you really get this sense of that that this his version of London is uh, a type of Gotham City. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally think that, that there's a big comic book thing in, in the show. I think that it, it shines through more later. I think that this is something that Cross was kind of toying with in um, the Satanism episode. Yeah, uh, I think this is it's, it's something that he began to kind of let creep in, sort of more fantastical, slightly more slightly slightly less gritty, less realistic, um, less sort of down to earth London drama um, that comes through later. But it is definitely present in season one. Even in the visual style, in one of the DVD extras, there's talk about how a lot of the framing that they like having loads of headroom in the shot, which I think is a kind of comic booky way of framing things. We wanted to, both with composition and lighting and framing, so show who he is and how he thinks. I think particularly what we felt was that we're dealing with a thriller and we're dealing with this man's way of looking at the world and the way his mind works and that we wanted to get a little bit of tension into it. Uh, for the thriller aspect, but we also wanted to have this slightly skewed worldview that Luther has. And then we arrived at this, uh, what's become a bit of a Luther framing, uh, lots of headroom and short-siding frames and people pop right down in the bottom corners of frames. I think the style is, is, is a big part of, you know, the way Luther's mind thinks, you know, it's slightly off kilter. I actually invite you to, to consider what's going on inside their head. It's almost like the equivalent of the space where the thought bubble goes in the cartoon. You as a viewer can sit and watch what you want. You can watch Luther, but then you can watch what's going on behind. The reflections and the framing are very important, and we've used all sorts of different styles and types of glass where you can see through glass, you can see into glass, you can reflect from glass, and it alters the framing considerably. And that they really try to emphasise lines in the shots as well, because they see it as Luther sees the world in lines, so there's this big emphasis on gra graphic lines like a comic, and his worldview is kind of comic book, the way he sees uh, good and evil, and so this is emphasised in how a lot of um, the visuals are thought out too, which I thought was really cool. Here we have an example of the, of the glass and the reflections that we're using in Teller's office. You can shoot through this window, you can reflect the office behind you at the same time while you're looking at Teller. It's great to be able to sit behind Teller's head and shoot all the way through to go through all the glass division panels. And you see people moving behind that, layers of light, layers of texture. Luther sees the world in its lines, quite graphically. So we were always looking for graphic lines in our compositions and shapes, and I think you can see it in the finished films. I remember very early on banning the word gritty because everyone just, you know, they, they, they read the content and they go, oh, it's very dark, it's very gritty, and it's like, no, it can't be gritty, it's got to be beautiful, it's got to be luscious, it's got to be something you want to watch rather than you feel terribly depressed about it. I think it's a great insight into his character as well, isn't it? Um, because this is something that Zoe actually points out. Zoe, I think, being one of the most uh, intuitive characters of the show. Um, I think she's really able to pick up on uh, Luther's theatrics yeah. and his... Uh, and, and his. I, I think I've posited to you before, and I think I'll probably go on to this a bit later, um, about how I see Luther as, as a narcissist and somebody who's trying to... Hmm. Um, I, I don't think he is actually the force of moral good that he is presented so often in the show. As I, I think that something that that Zoe brings up once or twice, the idea that um, what's that line? The line about uh, had he read a different book at a different point in his life, yeah. he would have been a very different man. Uh, there, so that, there, there are certain things, and I understand that this is building him as as you know a very moralistic person, but it's also it also builds him as quite susceptible and vulnerable to change and the, the, the opinions of others. Um, and I think he, I think he genuinely wants to be a good man. I don't think he's a narcissist in, in like an evil, in an evil sense. I think he's a, he's a very realistic narcissist in a way. I, I know narcissists like Luther, 
so yeah, I, I don't even remember what the question was at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 something that I thought we should bring up there. I think let's dive into episode one from here. Unless Tom t- has anything he wants to say to all that. No, nah, no, nah, let's go on. Okay, episode one. What do we think here? Do do you want to start with how it starts? Because that's kind of a big mission statement for the show. That opening scene. It starts with Luther uh, chasing a. What exactly is he? A pedophile, kidnapper type of guy? Yeah. And into this kind of industrial building, the guy ends up dangling off an edge over a really long drop. And there's this big exchange between them as Luther's trying to, he's on the phone with the other cops and they're trying to save the girl and all that. And eventually she is saved. So it's all resolved. He's got the information out of the guy. The girl is saved. But Luther really sticks on this point of how much this guy has done uh, and how much it's rankling Luther. And so he doesn't pull the guy up and he lets him drop. And it's a real drop too. A stunt actor actually did that drop. That's He really fell a long way. And that's kind of how the show opens on that moral note of Luther as this. I guess it's in the uh, the Philip Marlowe tradition as the, the detective with moral issues, the kind of beaten and bruised central hero, not just the analytical, brilliant Sherlock or Miss Marple type, but this kind of morally murky type of detective instead. And the show really opens on a note of that. What do we think of that scene? There are two things I wanted to bring up about the way that the show opens. The opening shot, and then that uh, that bleeds into, as you say, the chasing of uh, Madsen, the paedophile. So it opens with, an, in, as you say, an industrial warehouse, but it's very shoddy. Um, and I, th- I, think, I think that what uh, Cross is doing is linking deindustrialization with the collapse of moralistic society. Um, and this warehouse is actually called KTR Medico. KTR, I would just assume being, you know, it's, it's just meant to re- resemble a, a factory name, a company name. Hmm. But Medico, as in physician, which I, I can, the, the only way that I can draw Medico in my mind with Luther the show is, of course, with Luther the man. So the idea that Luther is the physician healing the the problems of this this uh, deindustrialized wasteland with with all of its uh, um, moral downfalls. Yeah, and that's the very first shot of the show you're describing there. So I can totally see interpreting that as like a big opening statement. Yeah, Tom Tip, what do you think of this opening scene? Um, well, it's literally very edgy, isn't it? It's over an edge. <laughs> um, it sets up Luther as a man who is on the precipice, and I think it's kind of a good Chekhov's gun, like. It, you're immediately faced with the idea that this police officer, you know, is not afraid to maybe kill someone if it comes to it. And you're sort of wondering throughout the rest of the show, will he kill someone or won't he kill someone? Um, it was very evocative. And it's kind of interesting to start the show with the end of like the definitive battle for Luther's soul. Yeah. Rather than showing it. But then every week subsequently, it's like every week is a battle for Luther's soul. Um, it's not really a quiet... <laughs> Uh, precinct in Luther but yeah I like it I like it it's evocative I don't know because I haven't looked at the blurb or anything but I assume the prequel novel released after series two is like the actual story of Madsen that ends here I I don't know if I'm asking for you to to clarify that or not do you think it's worth clarifying you're getting yeah that's that's a pretty warm you're getting warm with that guess I'd say in fact scolding that should that should be interesting I like that note that yet that Every week is like a moral crisis and a battle for his soul. So it starting so in media res, it's starting on what feels like the end of an episode actually is just kind of the the norm for him. Yeah, that's that's interesting observation. The first scene is also the first time we hear him speak. I think my and Tom's lack of Britishness maybe isolates us from this a bit, but I know Tyler, you had it interesting observations on the accent Elba uses for the role. Yeah, Elba uses what I believe is is pretty much his own accent. It's just a sort of a London working class accent, which I think is fascinating because I'm not sure that I can name any other British TV detective prior to 2010 who was doing that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Do you think it connects in with like, I get the impression Cross was kind of going for a, this isn't your this isn't Midsummer Murders. This isn't like an upper class kind of yeah. detective thing. So I feel like what Elba's doing there syncs up with what Cross was doing anyway. Yeah, whoever had been in the role, I think, would have done something similar. I think that's exactly what he was evoking. What it was that I was going to say actually is a lot of the time, characters who are uh, who speak more kind of eloquently with a uh, traditional sort of RP, um, like McGann, will 
whenever they're in a scene with him, kind of uh, adapt their accent towards his. There is there's this really great scene in uh, I think it's episode three off the top of my head, where Luther is having a relatively um, calm conversation with with uh, Mark McCann's character compared to the other conversations they previously had, and Mark is dropping his T's and dropping his G's from his I and G words. Uh, and I, I find that really fascinating because that is something that I, and I, th- I think that's very on the nose for, for McGann, uh, for the type of character that he's playing. Um, I described you uh, to him, uh, described him to you at one point as I see him as like a sort of champagne socialist, very fitting of McGann. Um, and he, he really plays into that so well. Yeah. Uh, as we move on into the episode, so we have the kind of beats of Luther is like damaged and he's been off the force for however many months. And the worry is like if Madsen wakes up and he's like, hey, Luther, let me fall. That's fucked up, guys. That Luther will be, ooh, you know, like in trouble. What do we think of the stakes of that kind of drama? Of course, it gets dealt with interestingly eventually. But what do we think of setting that, that up as stakes early in the series? That says it all, <laughs> I, I suppose. <laughs> I, I, it strikes me as kind of a a little bit inert, in, mm. inert, I should say, that to have a man in a coma be sort of the uh, the thing that is picking at Luther's conscience because there's not much you can do. Um, and indeed, there's not much that is done until quite late in the series. I'm not sure. It's not like it doesn't. It I, I wasn't like chomping at the bit to find out like oh what's going to happen with him. I think oh, how to put this. This might come across more in uh, the scenes we get with Luther and Zoe. His well, what is she to him at this point? Do, what does he think she is to him at this point? Because he's <laughs> he's obviously very perturbed when he learns how the relationship has shifted. Does he think she's just like waited for him? as he's gone off on his, however he's been coping the last few months? I think he thinks, I think, yeah, he does think that uh, they're on some kind of break, but it's not that serious. And she is going to get back together with him. And it- I think the scene where he goes over to Zoe's house, uh, such great acting in that scene. Um, uh, the What gets me with that scene isn't just like the big, um, you know, his wavering voice or the huge like explosion of... Uh, door related violence but it's the little things he does around the room that just read so realistically to me is what people do when they're super anxious or about to explode like how he fiddles with that thing on the mantelpiece it's like a totally random move he's just moving around the room and touching stuff but that I, that's so something i've seen people do before they have like a tantrum but where i was gonna fold that into the um the all oh, madsons in a coma stuff is do you think there's any aspects of well, the answer's going to be yes. What do you think about the first series, or even just the first episode, is kind of dated now? Um, or what do you think Cross might have done differently if he made the show now? If that's a different question. Okay. I think maybe in 2010, the genre of um, like hot psychopaths on television was still fairly nascent. Um, and you could argue that Sherlock was another early example of this, except they chose to make the hot psychopath the lead protagonist. Um, But I think, like, since this show came out, I can think of, like, Hannibal as obviously a a pinnacle of that genre, Um, and especially Killing Eve, which, like, is a sort of ultra-feminine take on that genre, which I think, like, Villanelle is sort of what Alice Morgan wishes she was. I don't know if anyone's seen Killing Eve here, (laughs) but um, so much of the Luther and Alice stuff, you kind of, like, it's good, but you wish... Um, the story was more about her rather than she's just sort of commenting on it um, because she is such a highlight of the show. Um, So, yeah, I I kind of just wish she was more active. And I also wish that Zoe... uh, I think, Tyler, you sort of indicated that, like, you've found a little more depth in her character than I did, but I found her to be fairly bland um, as a character. And I think just more focus on her and less focus on just Luther brooding. Um, that's sort of how I feel about it. I think for me, it's a fantastically played scene, his explosion at the door, but it's like, I think it kind of crosses the line where he's a little too dangerous or scary. Maybe I th- I think the show is playing that in a way where some viewers now wouldn't read it 
uh, the way I think Cross and Elba meant it, where it's just like he's really psychologically, he feels assailed by what Zoe has done here and he's quite infantile in a lot of his uh, thinking uh, and so he has like a tantrum like that. But I think the kind of, like he's so large and imposing and he's 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 uh, he cuts a really striking figure and so for him to like explode in violence like that, I think maybe if I'd watched this 11, 12 years ago, I might have more read this as, oh, he's, you know, he loves her and he's he's so stressed and everything. And now I'm like, fuck, he's, <laughs> this is really intense. I would feel terrified if I was her. I don't know how it was meant to be played at the point. I agree with you. There's, there's been a bit of a, a cultural shift on that, but I do think that it would have been not equally necessarily, but still relatively concerning. I think in 2010 to see that I, I don't think it's something that you'd have that you'd have seen and gone oh wow he's a man in love I thought I think you, you you would you would have you'd have watched this and sort of it would it, it, I remember feeling uncomfortable with it I remember kind of feeling taken aback by it because this is clearly a, a, abusive it is actually yeah. abusive um he's he's not act, he's not you know he's not hitting her he's not assaulting her but he is abusing her in this moment and I think it is meant to be played like that I think first episodes also tend to sometimes portray their leads in ways that sometimes feel a little bit out of sync later on. Like uh, the actress for Zoe is quite relevant to this because she's, of course, in the first episode of Torchwood, uh, which does something with the Owen character that I think is so completely out of sync (laughs) with how the show wanted to be taken and how it wanted him to be generally liked if as an arsehole. Uh, so sometimes there's aspects like that um, super early on in shows. But yeah. Also, um, Cussie's explosion of violence makes me think of it. His size, I think, is treated interestingly in the show. I think the scenes with Alice do this more, where it's like they play with how how imposing you know, and strong he is and he looks and how small and innocent and girlish Alice looks are. Uh, I think that's a really fun thing the show likes to play with. There's a li- there's a little bit of a running theme of like the idea that Luther's um, sort of aesthetic or interests, if you like, are not like as um, conventionally masculine as like you would get from your first impression of him. Like he's into, I th- and I think this is a very author inserty way to write Luther, <laughs> but like he's into really like arty rock and roll from the seventies, and um, he has a bit of like a um, like flamboyant streak to him like i'm thinking of the episode where he puts on that beanie and the sunglasses and just everything he does is very dramatic and um like eccentric um yeah and i think the episode with um sean pertwee as the the ex-soldier guy really looks at that a lot this sort of masculinity thing and he's a big reader there's that Mm. running note that he reads lots of books and things that's right in the first episode when he's talking to alice uh Parts of it do feel author inserty to me. Like I'm pretty sure Neil Cross uh, does the David Bowie cutting up stuff and like rearranging it, and that's how you um, think of new, you know, pathways things. But it f- it feels authentic to the character to me as well. I guess it's he's such a um, fusion of Elba and and Cross, and then the kind of third aspect, the actual character on the page that that he feels very coherent to me. Yeah, Tyler, what do you think of of Luther's personality like that? There is. A big point often made, yeah, about, and I think it actually must run through at least five of the six episodes in season one. At some point, there will be some reference made to Luther being a reader. He reads yeah. a lot. He likes to read. Um, and then, yeah, uh, as Tom says, he he writes. Um, it's, sorry, sorry. As as Tom says, uh, he speaks with the with the Sean Pertwee character and kind of talks about how as a kid he always just wanted to write poetry and meet girls and so he's he's got he has got this um I don't want to say feminine because it's not feminine but not traditionally masculine yeah streak to him as you say I find it really fascinating but I'm not sure what exactly the point of it is I think it's I, I and again I think it does it is something that will show up later um but I, the the best the, the best purpose that that it is used for I think is the line that I've that I've or, that we've already spoken about uh, Zoe's line about had he read a different book at a different time. Um, I think the best thing that it serves to do is present him as susceptible to other people's ideas of morality. And I think probably the the fact that he's called Luther is probably very connected to the idea of like reading and auto 
didacticism, mm. perhaps, for any of you theologian heads out there, maybe. <laughs> Well, this talk of Luther and his masculinity, his relationship to his masculinity, makes me think of Alice's relationship to her femininity. What do you think of... I mean, there's the aspect where she's, like, she's making herself look girlish and innocent uh, to, you know, literally seem innocent. That's what she's doing in most of this episode. And then later on, after her and Luther have the big exchange, uh, (laughs) the, the dark matter talk and all of that, the yawning... After that, when she goes home and she starts searching on not Google for him and, you know, like learning about his life and, you know, beginning to play with him, uh, that little montage thing uh, with the great fuzz guitar music and he's driving home and London's all yellow and it looks so cool. And she looks completely sexually thrilled. Like she's gasping and like the screen is kind of shaking and she's like typing rapidly. I think it's interesting. Uh, he, He even talks, she asks... Uh, are you trying to beguile me in that big exchange? And he laughs it off like I wouldn't be that stupid. I think her and her sexuality is a really interesting thing uh, in the show as well. Uh, any thoughts on this kind of thing? It's a very sexually charged show. Uh, yeah. And I think not I think not only in uh, the relationship between the Luther and Alice, although obviously in, in the same way as uh, all other themes are best represented through them, it is best represented through them. Um, but sex is is everywhere in season one everywhere it's inescapable it's constant and it's what everybody always talks about um john has this line where he says to zoe um how is the sex you must like the sex and zoe says oh it's not about the sex and john says but it's always about sex and that's exactly what cross is doing in season one everything is always about sex but i find it really fascinating i think it's a really interesting theme to play around with in a detective show no less. I'm not really sure what it's actually doing, what it does for the show, but it does make for something enjoyable to watch, at least. I think you could definitely see the sort of central tension of um, Luther's discomfort within the police force and sort of being yoked to the codes and the regulations of the police force as a kind of um, emasculating thing. And so in that sense, I think it's very... Yeah, like you say, everything is about sex in Luther. Yeah, this is much more in the last two episodes, but I'm, I think it's interesting the kind of cuckoldry stuff it plays with, with the little triangle of, uh, McGann's character and Zoe and Luther, uh, especially how that relationship shifts. Um, I think the jealousies and the differing maturities there are so interesting, and it's kind of, I think Luther has almost this, uh, what would be the right word for this? Not childish, but he has a very kind of adolescent view of sex, I think. A very, like, he's very not macho in certain ways, as we've described, but he's very kind of immaturely macho in others. Like, um, I think Zoe is, well, sometimes she's fond of that, but she's not always fond of that. Whereas Mark is very secure uh, in who he is. And and I think Luther lacks that. And I think that's a really interesting thing to play with, uh, with the sex-related stuff as well. Also, on, on with Alice, I think it's Luther seems as like a someone she could actually be interested in because it's that whole, you know, thing of the show that they they have an understanding of each other. They have an intellectual kind of um they recognize each other's intellect and they feel appropriately challenged and intrigued by each other's intellect. He feels like a peer to her in the way most of the world doesn't. So of course uh, there's sexually going to be something there where she wouldn't have uh, for most people because, in general, he is interesting to her in ways that most people aren't. And I guess there is definitely, like, a weird jealousy aspect to it. Like, when Zoe comes into the precinct and Luther's always like, oh, um, I would love to talk to you, but I'm, like, like saving these like women's lives. <laughs> it's like Zoe would probably feel like um, she is very much in con- competition with the people Luther is saving. And Alice Morgan kind of, like, represents that as an actual figure who Luther can interact with. And also she like literally does the thing where she tries to affect uh, the relationship with Zoe and what's going on between Zoe and Mark. She's doing this like for Luther in many ways. Like she's taking such a huge interest in his sexual and romantic life. Um, it's, it's such an interesting web <laughs> between those four characters. I think people on the internet call it uh, ya- Yandia character type i may be pronouncing <laughs> yeah. that wrong but um not me yeah. but others yeah. would call it that <laughs> what 
Well, I think we're kind of circling around the, I think it's the big scene of the episode, which is the dark matter scene, the scene where I kind of sat up and went, oh, this is, this show is a bit different than what I thought it was. I can, I can see the guy who wrote The Rings of Akaten is the writer of this now, which is where in like the suspect interrogation talk. So it's, it's so it's after Luther's classic move where he yawns and she doesn't yawn. I think the, the, the interrogation isn't going that interestingly. And so he does the yawn thing and she doesn't yawn. And so he thinks she lacks empathy. She's the killer. You know, he, he makes that leap. L- Luther's all about the kind of emotional, kind of comic booky even leaps. But they're so part of the genre anyway. Um, and so after that, he goes in much more adversarial uh, to the interrogation room with Alice. Uh, and he starts, you know, saying how maybe I shortened your chair because I like making people uncomfortable in the room. He starts basically calling, call, he basically calls her a loser and a friendless nerd about, about how she went to university early uh, and, and calls like child prodigies freaks. And so they get to talking about dark matter. And Neil Cross starts doing the kind of sciencey, sci fi parallels between the narrative itself, where it's dark matter, it's the stuff that makes up the universe, but it doesn't interact with the things we know in the way we expect, says Luther. And Alice points out, but its presence can be inferred from its effect on other things, from its gravitational effects on visible matter. You know it's there, but you can't see it. What do we think of both like the specific dark matter conversation and also the kind of style Cross is going for with putting those kinds of things in the show? Um, I think it's neat. I get like, th- I didn't, this only just occurred to me as you were describing it, but it is pretty Twin Peaksy. like, except yeah. whereas David Lynch would use the language of uh, you know, cinema to communicate those metaphysical ideas. This is very like novelistic and like, um, yeah, you feel like you're reading like an 18th century romance novel or something, except they're talking about like, yeah, science and fucked up murders and things. But I think it is because it is so talky and because the actors are so good, it does basically work. And I think it's just, I think it's very neatly written because um, this is something that also just occurred to me, but like the, the gambit of the yawn and the not empathizing, it sort of feels like a mirror of what Zoe says about Luther's susceptibility to outside ideas and the fact that he is such a sponge for like literature and things. Whereas Zoe, no, not Zoe, sorry. Alice is so resolutely just herself that she doesn't even uh, catch a yawn from someone. Like she is so untethered by people's expectations of her and Luther sees that and he's like so attracted to it and then but Alice sees Luther's sort of instability and she's attracted to that and um I it just works I think and yeah just the style of both actors it's, it's contrasts with each other's re- other really well and yeah I, I felt it it just occurred to me because I was thinking dark matter uh what was being done with dark matter in pop culture in like the turn or so years before this and I remembered um the his dark materials novels, which I was super into as a kid, uh, are very much about dark matter. It's a huge part of the novels. That eventually got turned into a TV series uh, where where Ruth Wilson plays one of the leads. Uh, So that's an interesting little circularity thing. Uh, Another TV connection, uh, you brought up Hannibal earlier, and I think this thing where a killer and like the good detective are having a conversation and they bring up an intellectual idea, whether it's a sciencey thing or like a allusion to literature, and then they discuss it in these kind of guarded terms where it's clearly metaphorical for something to do with like gruesome violence. That's like, that's, that's, that's Hannibal. That's, it does it constantly, like every episode. Uh, so it's interesting seeing, seeing it done here a couple of years before Hannibal started as well. Tyler, what's your read on all the dark matter stuff in that scene? I find it interesting that it's another way uh, to plug Luther Reed's books. I think his immediate response to um, Alice says something like, uh, this conversation wouldn't win me much favor with other police officers. And he says, well, I read. <laughs> so <laughs> I, th- I think it's a, a lot of it is, is sort of feeding into, in, feeding into the ego stuff. Yeah. Luther. And I think it's a, it's a, a pretty clear cut metaphor, isn't it? For their relationship and the, th- the things that are unsaid and the way that their relationship acts as a kind of like a, a meta narrative for exactly what is going on and, and when and why and how. Um, and it's kind of the, the the discussions they have are a way for Cross to communicate exactly to uh, to us, the viewer, what is happening and what he is saying. Um, and all in this kind of cryptic, coded, things left unsaid way. So I think to, 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 use, to utilise dark matter like that and the idea of a child prodigy whose brain is capable of many different functions, science included, 
is um, is very authorly. Yeah, you, you brought up that like he would understand the dark matter stuff because he reads, and I can like totally see Luther reading like a pop science book on a weekend or something. I think it's so interesting to connect. I don't think what Cross is doing is just like a very simple. My detective reads. He's SMRT. You know, he's a smart one. I think. I think because there's that observation Zoe makes that you've talked about a few times, Tyler, where she's like, if you had read a different book, you would have been a different man. And there's also that Alice interrogation conversation doesn't end with the dark matter stuff. It goes on. He starts asserting his understanding of the world. He says, you know, killers slip up, criminals slip up. It happens all the time. And she points out, well, that's not like a rule of the universe. That's an assumption. That's your logic. It's not necessarily true. How have you collected the data to make that assumption? What if you only catch people who make mistakes? Wouldn't that skew the figures that you're basing your whole assumption of how your job in the world works then? And, he, and there's kind of a chuckle at that. And he points out, well, criminals aren't that smart, he points out. And it's coming back to his view of himself as brilliant. I, I read pop science books, you know, after all. And she says, oh, well, you know, if you're that smart, it must get so monotonous that, you know, criminals are so stupid. And it's true that a lot of them are so stupid that he will... Uh, you know, solve the cases so easily. But I love that she points out there's this faulty logic in how he sees the world. And I think it is, and I think it ties in with that Zoe conversation where she's like, if you had read another book, you would have thought differently. There are rules he thinks, you know, the world runs on and they're not necessarily true. They're just, they're a collection of his assumptions and what's worked for him before. And I think a part of the show is testing those uh, in a big way. I guess that, um, I guess that kind of thing goes into the narcissist stuff a bit. Well, I know Tom Tit's seen some of The Sopranos and Tyler and I have seen all of The Sopranos and <laughs> all three of us like The Sopranos. In The Sopranos, Tony Soprano is, I, I would call him a narcissist and he's also like not <laughs> a good person. Like it's, it's ostensibly clear from the start, but it's very clear <laughs> towards the end. Luther, I don't think is set up as a bad guy in the same way, but I agree with Tyler that you can very validly see him as a narcissist. Uh, Tyler, what do you think of this kind of depiction as of a good narcissist or that kind of thing being done in TV? I think it's a very realistic thing. It's something that I've seen before in my life, and I, and I actually think it's uh, completely intentional. I think it's something that Cross is drawing from real life experience, whether his own or uh, witnessing other people like this. I think that what a lot of narcissists and a lot of people with um, overly uh, inflated egos and, and re really, really kind of egotistical people. I think a lot of them who are who are intelligent and self-aware in the way that Luther is um, will, although not entirely, not self-aware enough because you know they're they're a narcissist and that's kind of how that's what you can read on Luther. But he's self-aware enough that a lot of what he does is drawing his moral code from other people and uh, other sources. So I think that in that sense, Zoe becomes, no, this is not entirely true. I was going to say that Zoe becomes like the, the, the they're like a, an angel and a demon, the, the, the good and the bad on, sitting on his shoulder, Zoe and Alice. But that's not quite true because Luther's not neutral. So I think that Luther is the extreme moral good and Alice is the morally bankrupt, morally grey at times, not necessarily bad, not necessarily good, but helping him to, offering him different worldviews. Uh, and Zoe is more like a morally neutral who's capable of, under I think she understands the two of them very well. And she doesn't get, as Thomas pointed out, she doesn't get an awful lot of time to sort of flesh out a lot of these ideas that I, that I think about Zoe. But I think that the time that she does get, she's capable of uh, interacting with John and then interacting with Alice in ways that demonstrate that she understands the two of them perfectly. And in many ways, I think that makes her um, one of the most intelligent characters of the show. And therefore it kind of means that she's capable of understanding the various themes of what's going on around her, the, the, the themes of the thing that Cross is writing. I think that Zoe is the one that he is best represented through more so even than Alice. It's that classic X thing that they understand you more than uh, you understand yourself uh, in a lot of ways, I think, too. That's, yeah, that's a great point. There's something I want to say to uh, how Alice and Zoe are different things, like in different in, in Luther's life. There's something I want to say to that. But first, uh, in passing, uh, you once brought up, uh, this feels kind of left field, but I think it actually connects in interestingly with the narcissist stuff. You, you once brought up David Tennant's Doctor. 
uh, to me in this kind of conversation. And you said something like, um, Luther is a force of moral good, moral good, but he's narcissistic in a kind of real world bad way, uh, not in the kind of 10th Doctor way. Do you remember your chain of logic <laughs> when you were saying this? Because I, th- I, I can kind of perceive what you're saying there, um, and I'd be interested if you could speak to that anymore. Because he's the 10th Doctor is a figure I think is relevant to these kinds of personalities, these kinds of discussions on this kind of personality. I think maybe what I must have been saying is by the end of uh, Series 4 and by the end of by the specials, um, the David Tennant Doctor was... Um, the, f- the first one. Oh, sorry, what was that? Nothing. Go, go on. Okay. He was um, so by I think by the the time Lord Victoria's stuff, he was uh, kind of an evil narcissist. Like he was a narcissist who was capable of um, making decisions not for the sake of morality, but but for his own choice. And I think that's something that um, uh, RTD plays with a lot throughout the entirety of Tennant's run is is the Doctor is this particular Doctor making cho- making these seemingly moralistic decisions for himself or for the sake of for the benefit of others because typically they benefit him and his ego and his ability to be able to say that he did this thing and his ability to uh run around a room in a, in a flouncy way and and scream and shout and yell and grin and and charm um whereas luther i don't think is quite like that luther luther as a narcissist is a, is a lot more uh reserved a lot more grounded um and he has these outbursts of narcissism, but he's not, I don't think, driven always by narcissism. I think, in fact, he drives himself more with a constant, genuine, um, or as genuine as can be for a man like him, need to help and save other people. And it comes out a lot, and it does read as trite. But I think when you see it in this way uh, of, it's not actually built into his character as a person it's something that he creates because he genuinely believes that it's the right thing to do um and he's constantly saving other people i think that they become two very different entities uh so two very different types of narcissists i think uh like doctor who isn't a detective show and so i think this facet is kind of obscured but a huge thing with a lot of detectives like i think um this was a big long running thing with uh, McNulty, the main character in The Wire, which Idris was in. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is a big thing in Sherlock, although I can't speak to that. But it's the thing where someone is in a job that's seen as nominally like good, uh, force good in society, like they're a cop, they're a detective. Uh, and so their big thing is solving the crime, like outsmarting the serial killer, outsmarting the cartels or whatever. And that's like, so you assume they're driven by like, they want to do good and they want to be a good force in the world and they want to help the they want to help. It's like with the Madsen thing. You think the drive is uh, he wants to save the girl, not that not that he wants to outsmart Madsen, because there is a distinction in this kind of thinking. I think with Doctor Who, uh, there are some scenes with the Tenth Doctor where it's kind of explicit that he's doing the detective thing, where they're doing a good thing, but their motive for it is this kind of egotism or this narcissism, where it's the detective likes outsmarting the criminals who are doing such a good job fucking over society. That's what's driving, them. you know, like in The Wire, it's often what's driving the cops is they really want to outsmart these gangs, which are so smart and are doing such a good job of subverting, you know, the city. It's not that they want to save, like, the citizenry so much, is it's they want to prove their own intelligence and superiority by wanting to outsmart the bad guys. And like with David Tennant's Doctor, like in The Waters of Mars, which you brought up, that's like the thing at the end is he's kind of crowing about, well, look at me, look how I outsmarted the rules of time, look how I managed to save all these people, who knows what I could do next. And he doesn't really seem that interested in the people he just saved, but he seems extremely interested in the fact that he could do it. He seems so interested in the fact that his genius, you know, and his will uh, could be imposed on the world in such a way to have that result. And so I think it's interesting uh, in the conversation with Luther, uh, so you're leaning towards he is actually driven by the force of moral goodness. He does actually want to save the people more so than he wants to outsmart um, the baddies. Is is that where you would uh, draw his character? I think he has to work to make himself that way. I think that it's something that is learned, and I think that's what Zoe tells us, is that he's learned to, to become this way. And it's not necessarily in his nature, it's just something that he feels is the right thing to do. And because he feels it's the right thing to do, he he maybe he does perform it, but he performs it so well 
that it it eats him up and in a in a way that in a way that other um overly emotional um too emotionally attached detectives um become really kind of hurt by death and people other people dying and other people being hurt luther is is genuinely in physical pain every single time every single death in the show that luther witnesses or has any kind of hand in he will make this face and he will kind of clutch at his body and he will be genuinely distraught. And I don't think that it is, um, I think it is performative. That's the wrong way of saying it. I don't think it's, enti- I don't think it's entirely untrue. I think he's, he made, he has made it a part of himself. Um, and he gets to express the, the more time Lord victorious stuff that we've been talking about, the more egotism stuff by episode six, I think, which considering we're, we're discussing the season as a whole, maybe I should leave for later. But I, I think that by, in this particular episode we're discussing, episode one, he is genuinely, or as genuinely as possible for a narcissist, a force of moral good. I think that is what that is what Cross is giving to us, a, a, as genuine for a narcissist as possible to be a force of moral good. I think Alice's, Alice Morgan's argument probably is that, like, if Luther surrendered more to his narcissism, narcissism to his ego, he would be more effective as a force for moral good in the world. And the reason that I think he is more genuinely driven by moral good is that, like, for so many of the sort of tipping points where it's it's life and death, the means by which Luther um, pulls through is not by some, like, tricksy intellectual sleight of hand. It's usually by just, like, cutting through the red tape and doing the simple thing and, like, not abiding by police uh, strictures, which is, you know, a whole can of worms in itself. But that's sort of like the the language that this show uses. So I think that, um, I think that like Luther's narcissism is possibly what um, drives his moral urge, perhaps. And I think that, that there's also a weird, um, like I think artists tend to sort of display narcissistic traits. And there's been so much ink spilled over this over the past, like, 10 years or so and and deconstructing it because, like, I think it is a very real phenomenon. Um, And I do see John Luther as, like, an artist who sort of, yeah, he wills himself into being as, like, a sort of creative act. Um, And I think that, like, I see Luther as an artist who is pricked by, like, having such a strong and acute conscience that like, he can't just sit down and write a story where he's a good guy. He has to actually go out and be the good guy. And probably if he was, if it was up to him, he would probably be Batman, but like, this is not a universe where that happens. So instead he's just kind of an edgy police officer. And so I think that like a lot of art is driven by sort of a sense of guilt of like, it's these sort of clever people who, know that they're clever, but they also are sort of aware that their cleverness can't actually go to any practical good in the world. So they make these sort of fake scenarios where um, it can come to some sort of good in in a sort of symbolic way. So that's another way where Neil Cross and John Luther are sort of bleed into each other quite a bit, I'd say. Um, yeah. It's an interesting sort of, yeah, framework that he's got going on. I think I can't see Luther ever, I can't see him expressing, like, you know how Tenet, would be like because i'm clever and that would like resolve the the i can't say i think luther holds himself to a higher standard than that and i think cross is interested in luther's narcissism in a way where i uh, the tenth doctor was done confusingly because i feel like there are so many actual interesting traits in there and i feel like davies often just kind of left them alone like he presented them but he didn't seem super interested in interrogating uh those kind of facets of the Doctor's character, whereas Cross feels interested to me in playing around with Luther's character in that way. Like the final scene in this first episode is that fantastic scene of Luther manipulation with Mark and Zoe where Luther goes over to the house and you, you see the kind of gambit. <laughs> Does someone else want to describe the scene? You know what I'm talking about. It's got the great shot of Luther and Zoe are like hugging and then parting and then McGann's kind of frowning in the middle and then Luther's like, you're all, you're all right, mate. Take me away to the other cops. What, what do we think of this scene? Because I, I think it's a very manipulative thing in the kind of vein of some of the stuff we've been talking about. I think there's a joy he gets in how he can overpower uh, Mark in front of Zoe, in, in front of cops. It's that kind of narcissistic thing of with such little exertion, I can have a huge effect on your day. 
you know, I can screw up your whole week by just doing a little thing and then I can go on my way. Uh, he causes such a tremor in that relationship, in, in, in that street in general, uh, by his actions there. And then he just gets to, you know, get taken away by the police and, and that's it for him. Um, but he's injected something into their relationship there. And I think he does take a sort of joy from it, which is kind of his 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 lesser nature um, with the narcissism stuff. There, he does definitely enjoy it. He he leaves this, the, the he 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 leaves in the back of a police car, looking extremely fulfilled and and, sat, and self satisfied. Um, and I think yeah, I think that the whole point of that scene. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there's a, a moment before this where. It indicates that he's about to go and do something with Zoe. He's about to go and do what he's going to do. So I think this is a plan. I think this is something that his intent is to go and di- just just disrupt her life, disrupt her peace, confuse her as to exactly what she wants, which he very successfully does because it it, it ripples throughout the rest of season one. Um, and it's really quite yeah, it's quite disturbing. I remember. I remember. Um, feeling really disturbed looking at yeah. the fact that Zoe was crying and confused and hurt and and you know M- McGann kind of feeling sorry for himself because he's just he's just been hit <laughs> and and all these policemen kind of you know the, 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 the these wooden tops kind of not knowing what to do with themselves because this detective has just pulled rank over them um and Luther being really satisfied with this situation that he's just created where this woman that he's he's just um completely t- made that this woman that he loves very distraught and brought uh, havoc to her home life that he knows will remain for days and he's very he's very self-satisfied about it it just strikes me now uh so it's two scenes in a row the first scene is alice and luther on the bridge and the next scene is luther outside the red door causing the havoc with their life in, in both of these scenes luther is kind of wrecking a woman's life in a way he's screwing up um the basis for what they wanted but the huge difference between them is in the Zoe scene, he is manipulating and patronizing her. He's playing her for a fool, basically. She doesn't realize um, the whole planned out gambit, which I agree is what it is there. But in the Alice scene, that's a completely intellectually equal thing. He's ex- being extremely honest and open with her and explaining exactly what he's doing. And they're having an actual intellectual exchange and battles, battle of the wills on terms they both understand there. But with the Zoe scene, it's like he's patronising her. He's 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 manipulating her in a way he's being honest with Alice and not with her. I think that's quite interesting. And I really love the the bit immediately after the the scene outside of Zoe's house where he like gloats to Alice Morgan over the phone. And it reminds me of like a poet uh, writing to an, a rival poet saying like, look, I've just composed my masterpiece. Like <laughs> I've just come up with an ontological argument for God's existence and... I've ruined McGann's entire career and look at me and he's just, yeah, he is so smug and self-satisfied and it's just great. I I only have a few stray thoughts about episode one left, but one from that exchange is when Luther's like, I'm a policeman. He says this a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something that, um, it's his self identifier. And I think it's the only identity that he actually really has. And I think this bleeds back really nicely into exactly what we've been talking about, about his, um, nature uh coming from his his moral code and the only thing that he's actually got to to substantiate any of it is the fact that he's in the police um and yeah he doesn't feel like a policeman i don't know about you guys he doesn't actually strike me as very much of a policeman um he's just kind of a a, a sort of a hero he is a, he is a batman he's not a, he's not a, yeah. a, a cop he's a or a columbo or yeah, yeah, sure. Or a, he's, a, he's a certain type of detective who's clearly not actually very interested in being police at all. He's just interested in, I guess, doing the right thing in, in, in his eyes. Um, so being a policeman, I think also, so not only does it do that for um, the idea of his moral identity, but also for the fact that I don't think he's really got anything else anymore. He hasn't got his wife. Um, he hasn't got any friends. Um, and his entire life, his entire night, days and nights, um, are spent in either in the, the Nick or, you know, out doing crime solving and he doesn't actually do anything else. And he lives in this, um, in this, I was going to say tiny flat, but it's actually rather large, but there's not much in it is what I'm saying. It's it's, it's literally just a mattress 
on the floor and there's no furniture and I think there's a little kitchenette. Guys will really live in spaces like this and see no issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a really common thing. And to be fair, I'm not saying that this is indicative of the fact that he's... I, I, I think it's just kind of like a, a, a very typical man thing. It, it does happen. But I think that... Um, the fact that he has he has nothing in his home and he has nothing in his personal life and he literally just has the force and he's constantly reiterating in quite a pathetic way, I'm a policeman, I'm a policeman. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that's I think that's that's fascinating. That bringing up Colombo uh, reminded me. I don't know the state of British crime stuff in the late two thousands well enough to know if this is true. But on one of the DVD extra, extras, they say it was quite fresh. That in 2010 they did a detective show, which is well. The thing with Columbo is it's not a who done it; it's a how to catch them. The format of the show is they really evolved outwards from the character. It seemed to me the, the the best way for us really to engage with him and to see his world through his eyes was to see the moral outrages that he deals with in order to understand the the cost that these crimes have on him. To that end, I took a leaf from Detective Colombo's book and made the story not a whodunit, but a how catch him. So we haven't seen this style of storytelling, the sort of Colombo style of storytelling, for a while, so it feels pretty fresh now. The way the drama's set up, where you do realise who the criminal is in the first few pages, I think that allows you, as an intelligent member of the audience, to sort of make up your own conclusions about how Luther should go about doing it. If you consider the procedure is right and Luther doing his own thing is wrong, then where do you sit as an audience knowing who the killer is already? What do you think Luther should do or should, shouldn't be doing in order to get the, the, the criminal? It just sort of makes it more about the chase, doesn't it? And I think, you know, for me, I, so surely the chase is better, isn't it? It's like, you know, you order a pizza or a Chinese and it's, I'm waiting for it, I'm hungry, I'm starving. And that's brilliant, they build, oh, it's, where's it coming? When's it coming? And then when it gets here, you eat it. I feel a bit sick now, so no, the, ch the chase is a bit better, isn't it? And it also stops those, uh, you know, like any Scooby-Doo moments or anything where it's going to be like, oh, it was, it was her all along, but she was fat and a bloke. It's, you know who did it um, from the start, and then the rest of the episode is you get to see the detective, you know, be able to pin them down. But it's not, a, it's not like how most detective stuff works, like an Agatha Christie novel where you're like, I don't know who did it until the end, and then you learn who did it, and that's resolved. This is, Luther and Columbo are different because they're about, you know who did it, but you're wondering how are they going to catch them or are they going to catch them? Uh, so that's that's an interesting connection with uh, Columbo, I think is interesting because it plays more into how the show is more interested in like the moral mystery of like the moral crises that Luther has more than like the plot mysteries of who did this, how are they going to get him? Like in that taxi episode, there's that great um, subversion where you think they've got the right guy uh, and then- they haven't, and the visuals have been doing a tricksy on you. And no, that's a that's a terrible example of what I'm talking about. Well, yeah, but it's it's because you're just as in that moment you're just as um, frustrated as they are because you know yeah. immediately it's not the guy. Um, so I, I, get, I get the point you're making. Luther does a bit of the sort of pretending to be dumb routine in the in the Crowley episode when he goes into the bookstore. That's very Columbo. This is this is a situation where the show isn't like The Wire. One of the producers actually um, explicitly described it as not like The Wire for this aspect, where the show is more interested in... Th there's not that interest in authenticity. Like, The Wire is kind of obsessed with um, the realis realism and the realistic depiction of the city, because that's part of what that show is. It's kind of an excavation of how things actually work in the showrunner's mind. But this Cross is much more interested in this heightened world he's made and these heightened characters he's made. So th th that less interest in the actual mechanics of the plot, um, I think melds very much into that. That's why we have that Columbo thing of we know who did it, you know, pretty quickly because the show isn't interested in making a big Christie-esque airtight kind of plot around the killer so much as it's interested in how can we poke and stress Luther and make him do this or how is he going to react to that. The cross is much more interested in that sort of thing. I think my only other thought about episode one is they were so impressed with that dog prop they made weren't they <laughs> yeah. how many shots did we get of the gruesome alice's dog yeah i i genuinely think um i know it was rhetorical but i think it must have been at least five and they lingered <laughs> yeah. for a long time i think in the credits there's a 
person named Paul Cross who is credited as production designer. So I wonder if like this whole show is just an ex- like Neil Cross's brother just makes fake dead <laughs> dogs for a living, and this whole show is just an elaborate excuse to show those off. Maybe this. Oh, I did have one more thought on episode one. I left hanging earlier when Tyler was bringing up uh, Alice and Zoe is like the angel or devil, and I know you backed off that thought, but what it reminded me of was another gem um, from the extras. Uh, where one of the producers goes into how there was at least at a point a conception of Zoe, Alice, and Teller, Teller, the police chief, as like the Greek uh, three women thing. Three stages of womanhood. Like the the virgin, the mother, and the crone. Zoe, Alice, and Teller are based on the three stages of womanhood. This is very, very sort of ancient storytelling, so it um, shouldn't be taken literally. But you have the Virgin, who is Alice, and you see the Virgin a lot in fairy tales. And she is fresh in life and looking for new experiences the whole time. The second stage is the mother, and that's Zoe. And the mother is all about nurturing. And then the third is, Saskia shouldn't take this personally, but it is called the crone. But it means the woman who has been through those earlier two stages and has now got uh, wisdom. And Neil was very keen to sort of loosely base these three women on these different aspects of womanhood. And then they should circle Luther. They're played by three astonishingly strong actresses. And he's sort of torn between all three of them. And you kind of feel for this guy because he is kind of sometimes just spaced out and he's trying to do his job. And he's got these women making these huge demands on him. (laughs) Does Cross's thinking here stun you both? It did remind me of the actual scene, the final scene of the series where the angel and devil on the shoulder idea is kind of played out literally, except instead of Zoe, you have Mark North kind of as a Zoe proxy. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I think this is, a, it's not its not the most misogynistic show I've ever seen, but it, but it is. <laughs> and I do mean misogyny in the sense of um, women hate. I, th- I, I do, I do in, in a sense, think this is actually uh, sort of a show about hating women. And maybe that's maybe that's maybe that's a bit of uh, an exaggeration, and, and I know that Cross wouldn't like that. And I think he would argue that it's a show about loving women and, and showing the, the the virtues of women. We'll get into this a bit later, but there's a development later in the series which completely surprised me, and I didn't see coming at all. And I think part of it is even that I wouldn't expect a show to do something like that. Certainly now, in 2010, it might have been more normal. I know they still characterize it as a huge surprise. Uh, what happens? But it's kind of playing into that dated aspect we talked about earlier and also <laughs> some of the misogyny stuff that you know what I'm talking about. There's a thing that happens and I wouldn't have thought that was going to happen. And I, it's, it's just interesting that part of that is this kind of meta aspect of like, <laughs> I think shows try to avoid doing stuff like that now. Uh, <laughs> but we can cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, we're going to have a lot less to say in episode two, but I know this is a way to start. What do we think of the... I guess this ties into the dated thing again, maybe. It's a it's a show, it's an episode about cops getting killed. And so it's like the police force all assemble up to, you know, protect themselves from the cop killers. You characterized it to me as copaganda at one stage, uh, episode two. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely think it is. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it undoubtedly is. Um, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily... Um, I don't know. It's hard to talk about these things, isn't it? <laughs> knowing that this is knowing that this isn't just a conversation between the three of us. So let, let me let me get this straight. It's not the most misogynistic show you've ever seen, and it's not the most heinous case of copaganda you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is relatively heinous on both cases on on the sketch on the spectrum of, of heinousness of those two things. It is kind of up there. It's the kind of thing. Um, shows like this do they will have an episode where like cops getting killed because it's like a huge stakes thing i just think it's kind of interesting how that plays especially well i think i think we'll all have something to say to this but what's really fascinating for me is the different ways the military and the police are characterized in this episode um because they characterize very differently and i think that's quite interesting it's not necessarily the way i would have thought them to be characterized. I don't know if this is an Australian cultural difference, but I was fascinated by, and I guess partly it's, I mean, 2010 is 2010. It's much closer to the Iraq war than now. And it's contemporaneous with Afghanistan stuff that now wouldn't be. I think the thing that Cross is doing with the military stuff juxtaposed with the cop stuff is both of these are 
very similar types of um, authority kind of careers. Um, but the, the, yeah, the two of them are presented in, in different ways. The, the, cop, the cops are presented as very important, vital part of, of national life, and, and they, they are there to help and you know, protect and serve, whereas the, the military is, is um, what Cross is doing is, is uh, deconstructing a lot of the values that many people hold about the military and kind of presenting to you, them to you as, actually, we don't need these people and a lot of them are psychotic and and you know in many cases maybe they just needed counseling rather than to go to war and uh it's it's really interesting that these these two vocations are extremely similar one on in in one i would say i know this this is reducing a lot of what both of these things are but in in terms of um being police you're you can kind of see it as you're fighting on the home front yeah. You're fighting at home against against you know it's, it's almost like a civil, um, that like a, you're like a civil militia, uh, whereas, you know, the, the military is is elsewhere. It's it's international. Uh, it's it's on the um, international front. Um, so I don't see much of a difference personally. And this is this this is kind of it's hard to talk about these things. Um, in I'm I'm trying not I'm trying to take a relatively apolitical stance. But the way that I see these things are very interconnected. I don't see cops actually as being that much different whatsoever from the military. So to watch this episode telling me that the military is awful, but the cops are good and important was... Well, yeah. Yeah. We're trying to hold to the BBC line here and say <laughs> apolitical <laughs> about it. Uh, I, th- I think the external factor is a big thing. Like, uh, British military uh, got well... Um, yeah, they're going off elsewhere. They're going to the Falklands. They're going to Afghanistan. What they're doing is somewhere else, uh, which makes a very different perception than the cops who are doing something inside of the country. And whether whether this is like a perception of positivity or negativity, um, it's a huge difference that the, there's a kind of other aspect uh, to the military where there's a kind of the, the police are with you where the soldiers are away. <laughs> Tom, did you do any thoughts here? I don't know. Just just play the clip from The Dark Knight where that bad extra is like, no more dead cops. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, you, a more fruitful, more fruitful aspect of discussing the military stuff is going to be Luther himself, who grew up around soldiers. We learned that in this episode. What do we think of that stuff? Mm, yeah, this this stuff is fascinating. Yeah, because if 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 the military is being presented as um, genuinely bad i think that's that there is no actual redeeming factor of the military in this episode it's all everything that cross is saying about the military is that military bad um so for luther to reiterate a couple of times that he grew up in a military family grew up around military men and wanted to be very different from them and ended up a cop (laughs) it's um it's fascinating that the 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 ideological difference there so clearly cross's cross's value uh, his, his, his ideology here is that um, cops and military are not the same thing. And I think that the best thing for us to, the, the best way for us to approach this is to try and talk about it through this lens. Cops and military are not the same thing. It's what, it's what we're doing in the show. We're being told that um, cops are a force for good, for good. They do a different job. Um, and the military, you know, they, they go out and, and aid uh, towards killing people, which I can understand and I can sort of, in some sense, get behind. So I'm not completely against it, which is kind of what I was saying when, you know, this is not the worst case of propaganda I've ever seen, <laughs> but it is it is up there. Um, so Luther growing up in the military uh, is presented as um, quite traumatic for him uh, and shaping him as being unable to... Um, unable to um allow himself to to have what he sees as feminine traits and trying to impress his dad with more masculine traits uh and yet always failing and it also probably explains his sort of suicidal borderline suicidal behavior at the end like when he's confronting the shooter like he it's kind of a freudian thing like he's sort of he might as well be talking to his dad and is like you know have i disappointed you dad etc etc yeah yeah that's exactly it yeah, I think there's a layers of abstraction thing here where for police, there's fewer layers of abstraction. With Luther's job, he will go and he'll find a pedophile who's, you know, 
uh, been wreaking violence on children and he'll stop the pedophile and the pedophile will go to jail. This is a very kind of simple line of logic to follow. There's a bad actor uh, in the community and he eliminates that actor, uh, you know, into, into jail or wherever else. It's all very internal and it's very easy to understand. It's this kind of morality uh, which is very appealing. With the military, and the Falklands gets brought up specifically in this episode, it can be perceived as, you know, a very good and righteous morality, and it often is, but there's so many layers of abstraction to it that I think it's a kind of road where madness can lie, which is what happens with the the soldier uh, in this episode, where it's like, I am killing people in Iraq, or I'm killing people in Afghanistan, or I'm killing people in the Falklands, and this is a good thing. And the logic is because by doing this, I am da 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 and it will come down to, you know, I'm protecting Britain or I'm, I'm protecting my community. But it's so abstracted out because you're not in your community. And these people in Iraq or Afghanistan aren't in your community either. You're in an entirely different place in the world. Um, so there's so many bits of logic where you can make a line through it um, to make perfect sense in your head. And, you know, the media does this all the time. But it is tricky in a way that I think policing is much simpler because it's you, you're inside a village. And if someone does a crime in the village, you take care of it. Whereas the military is, I will go on this boat or I will go on this plane far, far away. And then these people aren't in my village. I've never met them before. They speak a different language. It's so disconnected. Uh, and I think with Luther wanting to be different from who he grew up with, but becoming a cop, it's kind of that classic thing of a kid wants to be different from their parents. And I end up very similar in the end. But there is a difference, uh, at least in terms of degrees. And I think that difference means a lot to Luther, who... I don't think he'd be able to brook being in the military at all because I think that line of logic would not work for him of, of I'm in somewhere that isn't London and I'm wreaking violence on people. But this actually, this actually, I'm moral because I think it would, I think, I don't think that morality would work with how his logic tends to flow. There's a bit in this, which I think might be like peak cross, which is um, the final words of the shooter before he... Does, it, does the shooter kill himself in the end? I don't remember his exact fate, but he, no. his final words basically are, um, do you ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Which I see as a deliberate quoting of um, Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols. Like that was mm. his famous sign off at the end of his last concert was, do you ever get the feeling you've been cheated? And so drawing the parallel between like soldiers on, on tour and musicians on tour who have both <laughs> feel like they've been mismanaged, it's like that is peak cross. And I think what we have here with this show is basically sort of the... Uh, metaphysical battle between good and evil as seen by basically a, a divorced punk. And I, I don't know if Neil Cross is actually divorced or not. I haven't, I haven't done the reading, but I feel like sp spiritually he is very divorced. Um, yeah. I think but, there's this interesting yeah. thing in 2000s British TV. Oh, this is literally in Doctor Who as well, in a, in a much louder way, I would even argue, in, um, in series one. I think there's a kind of resentment of war brought on specifically from, I know this episode talks more about the Falklands, but I think this kind of general resentment is more specifically from Iraq. And I think it's can be channeled in kind of a contextless way in the way that so many political things are. Where I think that's where we can get this tension of the differing depictions of policing and morality. It doesn't and military, it doesn't necessarily need to make sense. It's the these writers can have a resentment of the military and a praise of the, the police because there's a kind of cultural resistance to the military at this point, or at least to, to outside wars. Uh, but there's also a propaganda aspect where the culture maintains a huge hosting of and promotion of the police. That's part of how <laughs> there are so many police shows and so many detective shows. People want them. And part of the reason people want them is they're made so much. And part of the reason they're made so much is because people want them. It's a very self-perpetuating thing. Uh, I think th I think the two things existing, it, it, it doesn't need to make sense because that not everything in the culture will make sense. One of Luther's lines uh, is, um, if there's one thing you'll learn in Iraq, it's how to make an IED, an improvised explosive device. Hmm. <laughs> and that's, I've, I find that really fascinating um, that Cross is, is essentially saying that, you know, you're, you're not going to learn anything from, from these wars, which I suppose, you know, this is not, um, I'm not, I'm not against this and I do actually in, in a sense agree with this, but it's just interesting to juxtapose that idea that you're not going to gain anything from going to war in Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever it is you're doing, uh, on a military front, but you will as a cop. Um, so the fact that Owen Lynch says to him and Owen Lynch obviously being 
kind of a, a, a reflection of Luther himself and his relationship with his father, do you ever feel that you've been cheated? Is um, I wonder whether do you do you think Luther feels that he's been cheated by the police? Do you think that he's been indoctrinated? Um, because I think that's quite hard to answer, and I'm not sure what Cross is quite doing with that. But the fact that he asks Luther. And the fact that they, I think, are meant to reflect each other, they're meant to mirror each other, uh, possibly says something about about Luther's feelings towards the police as well as his feelings towards the military. I think it's different now, um, but I think especially in 2010, there's just much more of an organic support of the police in the media and in the culture, whereas the military is a, a, a separate thing. So I think I, I don't think Luther is holding a huge grievance are with the police necessarily at this point, but there are some lines drawn because there's that great bit about because obviously the whole psycho killer stuff to bring up music again, the whole psycho killer thing in the episode is like the 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 military. Um, there's this kind of perception of it that the military is made up of psycho killers because who's going to go fight in who's who wants to go blow up people in Afghanistan or whatever. There's that kind of sense I get from what the episode is doing with the military, whereas police have good people seeking justice or are they the very weary cops who their hearts might not be in it, but by God, they're still doing, you know, good work kind of thing. But in both situations, the line, I think a connection drawn is the idea of the institution, the institutions failing them in terms of mental health, because we get that bit about the office of therapy uh, in this episode, right? And it's kind of shrugged off in the police. And so the the grievance is almost a cultural thing that the cops themselves are perpetuating because I don't know how good or bad um, the therapy offered through the police is here, but it's interesting that they have their own sort of cultural resistance to it, at least in this in this unit, in this episode. And of course, with the mil- mil- that's a big thing in the military, of course, is, is, yeah. is the, the, the therapy not working or not being present enough or the culture not working with it. Ripley's line in brushing aside... Um the therapy is if my dad knew I'd gone to counseling, he'd, he'd, he'd shoot me himself. Yeah. That's what he says, which is very similar, I suppose, to what Luther's dad is and what Owen Lynch's dad is. So I think there is, um, cross is not, not, he's not building a wall between these two. No. Um, but, but these, you know, they're, they're not, they're not two completely separate things, but I think he's certainly saying that the, the police is the, the good and the, and the military is the bad of the two. They're, they're two sides of the same same coin, and one is better than the other. This is kind of moving off the military, <laughs> it's moving back into Doctor Who. Uh, there's a, there's a great iconic moment in Doctor Who in that big two parter in 2011 set in America, where to defeat the alien baddies, uh, the Doctor secretly records. Well, no, the do- the Doctor is the Doctor has one of his minions recording. Uh, the aliens as they speak because they've captured one and he manages to get a clip of the aliens which when used out of context can be blasted across the media and people are kind of indoctrinated by the clip out of context and so they then they then do they then go and do the thing that the alien said which has been clipped out of context because the aliens like brainwash people through that's that's how they work the you should kill them all on sight is the thing i'm talking about uh so the doctor prevails by a video clip which he's kind of manipulated and used in an out of context way that the alien baddies didn't intend but by clipping it out of context it has so much power to do something that the baddies didn't want to happen this happens quite a few times in luther at least the first series that luther does what i would call a day of the moon esque play a a, a, you should kill us all on sight esque play it's luther's favorite trick yeah it's his, it's his, it's his favourite way of, and obviously this is what's probably a better way of phrasing that is it's Cross's favourite way of catching a criminal in an episode is by having them confess themselves and having the intelligent detective out, outsmart them and and put them into that situation. Uh, it comes up a few times in this season, doesn't it? Yeah. So it's it's a great move because it kind of mixes authenticity with inauthenticity like when luther is having the big confrontation with owen lynch the kind of suicidal thing there part of what he's citing is stuff he knows that the dad sean pertwee has actually said so he can say phrases of speech where the son's like shit he 
this is legit. He's saying actual things my dad would say, which are real. But then he can mix it in with inauthentic stuff um, because he's kind of gained the validity of the authentic stuff. And then because he understands growing up with the military, he can also invent some stuff wholesale uh, and kind of have it, have a gambit on, I think this will ring true enough to him that it's going to work, uh, which I think is the piss stuff. Well, that was my assumption. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a, a whole bit about um, where L- Luther is um, taunting uh, Owen and he's saying... Um, your dad told me that, that you used to, when you were a kid, you used to piss the bed and you used to beat you for it. And then you came back from war and you pissed the bed even more. And he and he would give you shit for it again. And it there's, there's this whole thing about pissing the bed. And I think that because we, we don't get any of that with um, Luther's interrogation, I suppose you could call it, of um, Lynch's dad. So I think that the assumption that you have to make there is is that yes, he is actually making that up in a sense. So I think it says something quite fascinating about Luther's Luther's growing up. Luther, I, I, and I think I wonder whether it's supposed to speak to his childhood and something that he is his own experience that he understands that Owen will be able to. Uh, I will probably have had a similar experience of. It's interesting. I think this goes back. This goes back a bit to how we were talking about how Luther kind of he when he prevails in situations, it isn't because he's like done some Sherlocky analytical thing. It's that he has that goodness and that kind of will uh, and that empathy. Like in the first episode, the yawn trick is when he works out what's going on with Alice because he sees no em- empathy. The piss thing is him making a gambit based entirely on empathy. He's 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 hoping that he has this empathetic understanding and connection with the, the soldier enough that his experience is going to ring true because he can empathize with and understand the guy. So I think that ties again into like we're going, um, Luther's tension between his narcissism and his goodness. Uh, like I think it was Tom who said, he tends to prevail because of his goodness, because of his empathy. I I also think the narcissism stuff might tie into the kind of suicidality of this confrontation. I think it's it's very difficult for a narcissist to hurt themselves, uh, and particularly to kill themselves. Yeah, and I think that Luther, as a as a character, will toy with the idea of suicidality, and sometimes will make jokes of it, and sometimes will. Uh, and I'm speaking specifically in season one here. Um, I remember the, the 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 rooftop scene with with Ian, um, where they have like a, a bit of back and forth banter about well, are you going to jump or not? Um, I think that Luther would struggle to actually do any damage to himself, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he doesn't think about dying, and that it doesn't necessarily mean that he's not suicidal. The fact that he wouldn't do it. I, don't, I just don't think that it's in his nature to do it himself. Yeah. So to go, to put himself into situations as he does here with a man who might kill him and there's, there's you know, a chance. It's not, a hundred, it's not 100% certainty because that would be suicide. That would be le- the legitimate suicide going in to actually kill himself. But there's a, by the Russian roulette stuff, there's a, a you know, a, a, a probability that he could die. And I think he's willing to. Yeah. Um, he's clearly scared of it, but I think he's willing to risk the death, uh, his, his own death. Not even, not only to to catch this guy, but also just because he might die, and I think he's okay with it. I, I think it's also kind of a gambit on his brilliance. Like, he, if his thinking here holds true, then he'll f- survive. Like, I don't think he's anticipated the Russian roulette stuff specifically. He knows it's very dangerous what he's walking into, but he thinks he's this might well work. And, you know, if it works, then it's, it, it's, that's very validating. This, the, there's stuff later on in the show, a couple of times throughout, actually, where there will be more that we can talk about, about the fact that Luther can't commit suicide. He just can't bring himself to do it. He, I think he wants to do it, but I think that it, he, is, he is just naturally incapable of, of hurting himself. So he puts himself into dangerous situations. In order to, to 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 flirt with the possibility of it, if I had to guess, I'd say his mindset is that like 
if I he's thinking if I kill myself, then I won't be able to save this person and this person and this person down the line. So I think in that sense, I I would almost say that like separating his narcissism and his morality is kind of like a mistake. I think they're sort of like one sort of two headed. What's that thing? Ouroboros or a two headed snake something. Yeah. Um, it's like his narcissism is what keeps him alive and without his sort of um, his job where he's able to, as he sees it, make the world a better place, he probably would kill himself. But because he has that blanket, he won't allow himself to do that. Uh, yeah. And that's validated by how hopeless a lot of the other cops in his unit are. Like, um, Teller is a joke. I think a lot of the time, uh, Ian. Well, we'll see how stuff develops there. Ripley is a nerd, like so. Yeah, I think if that if it wasn't for him, <laughs> he's actually quite uh, correct in thinking things might go awry. Tyler brought up the rooftop stuff uh, a, a moment ago, and that reminds me of. I think that's a very comic book thing again. Uh, it reminded me of Torchwood. You know how Captain Jack would stand on the roof and like look out this is my city it's it's like a batman thing too you know this is gotham this is my city i'm the one who protects this i think there's the suicide stuff with standing next to an edge but i think there's also it's a classic framing thing of you when you have a character like world on their shoulders and they're protecting the city stand on a tall building and look out at the city it's a classic it feels like a kind of visual ownership thing to me yeah and this and the other detective show, which Tyler pointed out right out the gate, I think they're both very post The Dark Knight products. Yeah. And in that sense, Torchwood is very ahead of its time because it's a pre-The Dark Knight product. But yeah, yeah, this and Sherlock are both very informed by Dark Knight. Archie presaged a lot of superhero stuff. He, he did the whole crossover mm. thing a, co- a couple of years early too. The, the other thing in this episode I think that's interesting that we haven't talked about is there's the kind of Boy Who Cried Wolf stuff with Luther... And saying, uh, Zoe's in trouble, you know, uh, and Mark is like, I think if I didn't have the knowledge from the rest of the episode, I think I would totally agree with what Mark's yeah. saying that come on, Zoe, he's totally playing you. Like, it absolutely feels like that to me. We just know that it's legit. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think it's, um, Luther's comeuppance, isn't it? For, for, for that, for the play that he that he made at the end of the last episode, is now he's the boy who cried wolf, and he can't actually do anything to protect Zoe. Um, and this is another thing that um, that that echoes throughout. Maybe maybe the karma, like a it's like a, a karmic event that he just that he can't actually protect Zoe because he's they don't trust him because he because of this this uh, this slip um, that he'd made in the in end of episode one. It's yeah, you can't be the watchful protector. If you've already played your cards and then because you you've spent the goodwill you could have had. I've said everything I want in episode two. Do either of you guys have anything? Um, no. It's not much of a, it's, it's not like a, a major thought. I just, I, can't, I wanted to express that um, Megan is, is really good in this one. Um, and I think that this uh, is, I think that this barring episode six is his best performance in the show. Um, and the stuff that he does with, uh, talking through Zoe's relationship with Luther with Zoe um, is really important for our understanding of a the way Mark thinks of their relationship and b the way that Zoe misunderstands the relationship between the two of them, um, and actually just how intelligent and how good of a man Mark is. I think we got. Uh, I think we we. Well, I I remember re- watching this to, uh, when I, when I first watched it. I think I misinterpreted mark as mm. a very different kind of man than he was um and by this episode i realize actually he's just he is in love with zoe and he is a very emotionally intelligent guy um who is just caught in the crossfire of these two very toxic people his issue is he is emotionally mature and i find him very admirable for, i mean he's he's a bit of a loser <laughs> in a lot of ways he's this kind of yeah. um contemptible little weak effect yeah little middle class um yeah, he's he's pathetic in some ways, but emotionally, I think he's quite strong. He's he's very secure in himself in a real way. Like initially, when he's like saying, "Oh, I, you know, I'm secure in my masculinity," I'm like, "Yeah, come on, mate." But as the series goes on, I I think he's completely legit. I think he actually is super secure in himself. That drives a lot of the choices he makes. And so for him to have this emotional emotional maturity and be in this triangle 
with the quadrangle, really, uh, when Alice gets pulled into it. But Alice is pretty crazy, and Zoe and Luther are both not particularly emotionally mature, I think. Luther much more so, but Zoe as well. So Mark, he, his, <laughs> I guess his kind of flaw is that he's too mature for the circles that he's hanging around in. It is such a good performance, and I'm a big fan of the costume design for his character because, like, in his very first scene, he's wearing <laughs> that sort of... Like that wispy scarf and you think, yeah, this is a man who is secure in his masculinity. And you kind of just know exactly what kind of guy, like yeah. it's so, he, the type of guy he is, is so real. And he is the sort of guy who you would meet and you'd think, oh, you're kind of a wanker. But like, if you were to get to know him, you would, you would see that he has, de- has depth and layers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely also, I find Mark, and I think, I do think this is intentional. I find Mark a much more likable guy <laughs> than Practically than any of the other characters, actually, but Luther particularly. I th- I think consistency is really appealing in a character. The fact that Mark is consistent uh, with his morals and his he's kind of he he holds to what he says. I, th- I think that's really endearing in a, in a show like this. Episode three, I think. Well, we've talked about Hannibal before, and yeah, this is the Hannibal esque episode. It's the first like. What if we did a weird murder? You know, <laughs> what if there was a weirdly gruesome, you know, crime going on? Some weird guy doing weird crimes. It feels very much like that. Like you'd get in a Killer of the Week in Hannibal Series 1. And I think it also carries on some of the propaganda stuff from Episode 2 because it has the whole thing of there's this really bad guy and he's a really bad criminal. Uh, but he's hoodwinked the media and he's hoodwinked the people and he's made everyone think he's really innocent and that us cops are really silly. For pinning stuff on him, but we're we're right. You know, it's this guy who's bad. That's you know, hoodwinked everyone into thinking he's good. And look, he's got book deals and he does press conferences. And actually, we cops were right. He's the mark. He's the bad guy. And of course, in the show, the cops are completely right. But I think that kind of beat of oh, what if there was a guy who was really bad and the cops tried to nail him, but we didn't have enough evidence, and so he got off, and then everyone believed him, and he got all these payouts and everything. I think that's a very it's a thing you find in certain types of cop fiction because I think it's an actual real anxiety with uh, police. I wonder who was in the news at this time around in the in the last five years in in the, in the five years before um, Luther. And th- to be honest, the best and, and this is quite um, it's quite morbid and quite a controversial opinion, but the best that I can come up with is um, Madeline McCann's parents, Kate and Jerry McCann. Um, who many people at the time, I'm not sure how much of a, of how, mu- how many people believe this now, but many people at the time felt that, um, for anybody who doesn't know, although I'm, I'm sure that most people <laughs> are aware of the Madeleine McCann case, um, M- McCann was a, a missing child. She went missing at three or four years old um, on holiday. And uh, Kate and Jerry McCann are upper middle class parents who many people would argue were uh, treated in a, in a way that would have been very different than a working class family had been treated. Um, and this exact thing happened with them, not so much in the sense that, you know, the, the police were onto them and they got off, but in the sense that they did make a, a, a very nice living out of the fact that their daughter had gone missing and they did get a lot of press conferences and they did get a lot of book deals. So I think that I'm not sure whether it's exactly riffing on the McCanns. I'm not sure whether Cross would be quite so bold as to, as to say that the McCanns did genuinely kill their child and the cops knew about it and they got away with it. But I th- that, that's the best example of this that I can think of in real life. I think in super tabloidy countries, which both of us are from, I think there's a real concern with the kind of justice of very media heavy cases Uh, and i think there's a huge concern about who's telling the truth and how the police are handling things because i think i think it really cuts to the core of how people build up their worldviews of justice and of the police and of civilized society in general so i think there's this huge concern uh with these kinds of high profile cases with actual press conferences press conferences and stuff like we see in this episode i think there's a huge because people themselves don't want to be fooled and they want to believe the police are just as well but they also they they want to believe that i i yeah it's i think i think these kinds of high profile media cases where there's huge questions of whether someone is telling the truth or not and it's like gone beyond a regular crime and it's become like a whole media circus i think that's a very understandable thing uh, for 
British and Australian viewers, certainly. Uh, and so cross playing with that doesn't surprise me. But I think it's a very police anxiety kind of centric way he goes about it, where it's like, uh, don't listen to the media, guys, and don't listen to the regular people. They've got it wrong. We might not have been able to catch him or we might not have had the evidence or it might have seemed like it was someone else, but we knew what we were doing. And of course, they did in this episode. They, that guy was an actual freaky Satanist, blood-sucking psycho. Yeah, that, that's that's another thing, that the, the freaky Satanist <laughs> psychopath thing. It's re- really, really th- this vilification of the occult stuff. It's re- I find it really funny because I think that... Um, Cross is, is, I think he's a very paranoid person, <laughs> and I think I don't know what what goes on in his head, but I think he's very he's um uh he's very very um concerned about anything that does not um meet his ideas of of the social order, um, which I guess includes the military, um, but the the vilification of the occult stuff I thought was it feels really eighties to me or early nineties like it, it yeah, feels yeah. quite dated if for two thousand and ten let alone now it's weird that John Luther has a picture of a Crowleyist hung up in his bedroom in light of all this <laughs> yeah it's I I love that scene where he goes into the Satanist freaks bookstore and he's he's not even trying to, 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 <laughs> yeah, to like yeah. say, like he's saying the words but it's hilarious how he's playing that. Yeah, it's it's a great detective moment that, um, and that's something that uh, that Luther does a lot. And I think it's I think the there's a line that he brings up at some point later on. I think it must be episode six. He says um, that he doesn't need to be specifically disguised or specifically acting as somebody else. He just needs reasonable doubt, and it's something that he plays with a lot. It uh, El- Elba's great at that. I will say uh, this is actually one of the main reasons I don't engage with lots of crime fic. Um, like I'll is that I find lots of, particularly in television, there's this kind of casual way shows will go about just kind of propping up any kind of weirdos of society. And it's in this really shallow way where I don't get a sense any of them. Like, I'm not asking for Cross to be <laughs> pro-Satanist, but no- nothing in this ring super true. It feels like a kind of shallow uh, portrayal of this sort of thing to me. And I find that in a lot of crime, you'll see like when Law & Order does like a, a video game episode or whatever like they tend to be very very shallow and they're types of things that a lot of viewers inexperienced with the types of subcultures will just go oh so, so that's how that works and that kind of bothers me and it makes me bounce off things because i think it's a very unengaged kind of way of writing so the way this satanist is kind of treated in this episode makes me roll my eyes just because it feels like this big dumb stereotype and he's like literally sucking out blood and they don't actually go into any detail with anything that could be interesting about the Satanism. It's just kind of used as a marker of this guy's insane and he's so freaky. Like, if if the episode was the exact same, except it had a lot more detail, detail to the Satanism stuff and it kind of tied in some culturally relevant aspects of the history of Satanism in Britain into what the guy's doing, that might have been a bit more interesting. But as is, it just kind of feels like a freaky tabloid thing to me in some regards, how the actual Satanist plotline shakes out. And that's a shame because I think other episodes in the series are quite good at getting into more detail and, and more like cultural relevance with some of the other villains of other episodes. The only thing referenced that Burgess had in his occult shop was these handwritten letters of from, from the Yorkshire Ripper, and and, it's, yeah. and like like as, as if he's obsessed with um, murderers, which is fine. I mean, if 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 this if this uh, murderer is. Um, He's obsessed with clearly bodily fluids and other murderers, and I, I don't understand why he was a Satanist and not like just a guy who's interested in true crime and, and murders and things. Yeah, uh, because that that's more how he was presented than any actual form of occultism. You know, what might have been interesting. I don't want to go too much into if I wrote the episode, it would have been this kind of territory because I think that's lame. But the thing in the episode that does really interest me, and I think rings with more, if not authenticity, then at least cultural relevance, is when the Satanist guy is talking about, you know, a lot of women are actually really into this stuff. They are very sexually excited by true crime stuff. And that's interesting because, like, as I'm sure we all know, like, true crime podcasts and stuff are huge uh, and most of their market share does tend to be with women. So now we're touching on something that isn't just like a tabloid, oh, Satanists are scary. There's some kind of relevance to what he's talking about. If the killer in the episode had been not a Satanist, but had just been someone obsessed by true crime, like Tyler said, and perhaps had been a woman, 
um, obsessed with true crime, I think we would have been hitting on more interesting stuff there that could have tied into actual relevant things more. Because I feel like that's kind of a, just a note in the episode where I wish it was more of the whole thing of the episode was um, the relationship between femininity and this kind of fascination by uh, grotesque and gruesome uh, murder and assault. The reason for the existence of that scene, I think, is not um, it's not accidental. Uh, the sexual excitement for violence thing is is meant to tell us that, and it is kind of meant to sow that seed into Luther's head that that's what he's interested in in Alice. So it is important that we get a note like that, but it still doesn't detract from the fact that there's no there's no necessity for this guy to actually be uh, an occultist because I get no evidence that actually he is. I don't get any evidence from the episode whatsoever that he's interested in any form of occultism. He's just kind of a, a like an occult slash true crime grifter who's just kind of in, interested in um, generally gory, morbid stuff. This is moving off Satan a bit, but I I really like the um, the McGann stuff in this episode. And I know Tyler brought this up to me. Tom Tim may have arrived at this thought independently because I think it's only a connection um guys like us could possibly perceive but with steven moffat's sitcom joking apart uh tyler brought up to me you can make an equivalence between luther as mark zoe as becky and mark as trevor in the kind of triangle uh we get in this episode only this episode and not would that not just be across the entire series or it is it is across the whole series yeah and um i think it's uh, I think it's mostly just in, in the in the cuckoldry stuff and the fact that Luther won't let let go of her um, and sort of th- thinks in in a weird way that um, they're still together uh, constantly and that that's something that um, what's his name the Robert Bathurst character is doing and joking apart like he just kind of acts as if Mark just kind of kind of acts as if they never actually broke up and they're still together even when they are broken up and he it's a, it's a, a very strange dynamic so I think a, a lot of that is quite similar. Um, and yeah, I think the mark of this show, Ab- Ab- McGann, <laughs> is um, he reflects Trevor in a way that I think Trevor is also sort of much more mature uh, yeah. and much more of, you know, he may be boring and he is presented as boring, but it's, it's a very, they're a very similar type of character in, yeah, he is just, he is a boring guy and he, he is not necessarily somebody who's, you know, he's he's not a writer, and he's not a reader, and he's not a detective, but but he and he's, he's a real estate agent, but he is just good, um, and he's kind of caught between these two people who are kind of still in love and kind of interested more in the the toxic fling than they are in in real romance, and that kind of thing. I don't want to get into this too much, but I'm reminded of when Nicholas Briggs liked that tweet of like women only go for the bad guys. Um, it's, it's like that classic thing and this ties back into the occult sexuality stuff where it's like that classic tension where men, certain types of men perceive Ooh, women only like the crazy rogues and a stable nice guy like me can't get any of the whatever slurs they might use for women at that point. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Call it the collective unconscious of the divorced. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's just divorced writers, I don't know. Uh, there's, there's definitely a type, type of guy. Around this triangle of um, shifting back to Luther's Mark, not joking apart's Mark, with Luther, Zoe, Mark, I love the stuff of Alice try- I, th- I think this is so cute and so endearing and so weird, how Alice is trying to, like, please Luther by humiliating McGann's character in, like, such a ostentatious <laughs> way, by paying some, like, young girls to- beat him up i really love the way that alice gets off on, on just on just giving <laughs> mcgann shit throughout this whole season a whole thing is, with, with, with mcgann is not actually she, she's not actually got much of an interest in mcgann at all and, and she doesn't even need to be doing half the things she's doing i think she genuinely just has has fun toying with this guy so it's a, it's, a, it's a very funny beat it is a trope but it's a trope that i always love whenever it pops up like i just off the top of my head now is like um, Missy giving the Doctor an army of Cybermen, like to to make him yeah. be her friend again, that sort of thing. It, ha- it pops up everywhere, but yeah, it is. I do find it cute. <laughs> yeah. It's their their warped perception of what the the person they have a crush on might like is. It's just it's very endearing. It's very funny. Oh, this ties back to accent talk. But when McGann talks to Luther in this episode, uh, what what Tyler was talking about 
happens. Um, McGann starts dropping um, some some of his consonants as as he's talking to Luther. It's like he's trying to uh, code switch, or he's trying to like mar- he's macho himself up, maybe. Yeah, I think it's I think it's both of those things. I think it's partly, um, and this is something that you'll see quite often in. Um, people who either were working class and hang around in middle class circles or have always been middle class but would like to try to relate more to the working class. I know it's also a political phenomenon. Um, It's something that Tony Blair used whenever he was uh, Mm. up north. Uh, It's something that I think... But there's uh, there's something to be said for um, it being a a genuine thing, uh, not necessarily something you put on intentionally, uh, intentionally, where you try to put yourself onto the, <laughs> the the social economic level of the person that you're talking to or your perceived social th- their perceived social economic level um by talking like them uh and it's quite patronizing most of the time and it's not necessarily the intent it's not even necessarily in- intentionally done but it is it always comes across it comes across patronizing and slightly embarrassing uh and i i i do believe that McGann is aware of this because he is from liverpool himself uh which is um you know not every area in liverpool is um like economically deprived but i know that McGann did grow up uh that way based on interviews that he's had before uh, and he did witness uh life like that so i'm pretty sure that he's aware of this phenomenon and i think he is playing into that intentionally i think you can bring it back to the yawn in episode one because I think it can be an empathy thing. When you're talking with someone, especially if you're not realizing you're doing this, I think you tend to mirror some of what they're doing physically and you will tend to shift uh, even expressions you use. I find if I'm talking with someone for a long time, I might start to use a word they're using that I wouldn't normally use and I'm not even thinking about it. It's just like I think it's a a kind of unconscious empathy thing. But there's also... The conscious level is sometimes someone is actually intentionally trying to sound like who they're talking with uh, to, to like seem more macho or like to seem more like, oh, I fit in this area. Like you'll see with politicians switching accents and stuff. I think it's so hard because you can't read someone's mind and tell, are you doing this unconsciously or doing this consciously? I think it's such an interesting. I think that there's there's definitely an element of machoism to it. I know it's a real, a real thing that we do here in the UK with accents where... Um, because of where where I'm from, whenever I find myself in um, a sort of dangerous situation where I need to be, where I need to appear um, tough, <laughs> in a sense, I will um, sort of I, I I will, and I don't do this intentionally a lot of the time either. I will kind of naturally make my voice. I, I'll make myself speak in a way that I don't normally speak. Um, and a way that is closer to the the working class of, of where I live, um, which also, by the way, is me. I'm not I'm not middle class myself, and I do uh, in in many ways speak in in those in those ways naturally. But I I find myself upping it a bit when I when I feel that I need to because there is um, in this country there is a sense of um, perceived threat to, and this obviously is rooted in classism anyway. Uh, but there there is a sense of perceived threat to. Um, people who talk in a, in a way that is that is associated with the working class. So I think that's an, another thing that uh, McGann is playing with, with Mark. I think Mark feels, I think he does feel threatened, as most people would, to be honest, by Luther in this situation. And I think he is um, maturing himself up. I've, the perceived threat thing is interesting. I've known some people from the USA that try to pass themselves off as Canadian uh, overseas for various reasons. Um, a, lo- a lot of the times... It's beneficial to be perceived as American in certain countries, and sometimes it's not. Uh, so it's interesting to change your perceived threat level, altering your accent and uh, flubbing some of your personal backstory details. Yeah, it's definitely a thing. It's it, the class aspect of how it's done in Britain is is very interesting. Should we talk about Schenk? Yeah, this episode introduces Schenk, um, and it introduces Schenk in a way that you kind of see him as as this guy who. <laughs> He's in this role where his whole thing is he's working in in he is he is police and he's working in the institution as a man who uh, he's he's like a, a line of duty um, as, as I haven't seen the show but it's, it's a like like a line of duty style character where the, the, his whole thing is taking down bent coppers um, and that's what he's doing with Luther but he feels that um, it's not entirely just to take down Luther yeah he wants to and he will because it's his job and he does believe um, in 
uh, he has this moral code of, of a genuine belief in social order. And both, be- it, it's two things, I think, in this episode. The one thing is that um, Schenk is written in such a way that you, you get a really great sense of exactly the type of man that he is. Uh, and it doesn't change throughout the rest of the show from his first, his, his initial scenes. And it is per- it is perfect. You you get a, a great sense of 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 how he um, how he thinks, and it's also I think the actor because it makes him it makes him quite likable uh, in a way. Um, even if you don't necessarily agree with some of the things that he's doing, I think he's a, he's a very likable guy. And he gets this line: "I will take you down, even if I can't look myself in the eye afterwards." And he feels very strongly that he must just do the duty that he sees is right. So his whole thing, similarly to Luther, is a belief in doing the moral good thing. Um, But unlike Luther, he is more grounded in the social structure and belief in policing in the way that it's, uh, you know, in in procedures by the book. I agree that across the episodes, he's very consistent and coherent. (laughs) But uh, some of the goodies we found were that back in 2010 on iPlayer, there were these very short little in-character video diaries where it was it was like characters would record themselves talking to the camera, like in the police office. And it's not really like it's not that it's not like canon that they're doing this in the context of the show. It's more like a soliloquy type thing as they're talking to the audience. Uh, but in Shanks, because he got two, in one of them he was drinking like a like like a serious drinker he was pouring spirits into his uh cup or something yeah (laughs) and i thought that was interesting because that didn't really ring true to how i perceived him in the episodes so i don't know if the actor was improvising or what was going on there i think one of those video diaries i thought was quite interesting an ian one we might talk about a bit later but that shank one kind of amused me because it it felt off to me to the character that feels really consistent in the episodes themselves i don't see him as an alcoholic the truth of what I saw today. Luther commands great affection and loyalty. How do you judge the quality of John Luther's current operational decisions? Loyalty is um, a fine quality, but in excess, it can fill graveyards. And it is not only good men who command it. John Luther may be an outstanding detective, but he is also an unexploded bomb ticking down to zero. I have no doubt that Luther will lose his job. All that remains to be seen is Will he also find himself in prison? Time will tell. It always does. No, he's not. Uh, And it's... I'm not sure what was going on with that. I wonder whether that was something that was written um, before uh, any of the final scripts were, were were performed or or if it was even recorded before then uh or if it was just like a bit of fun it, it does at times strike me as this is just something that partly was just done with the cast just kind of as a way of kind of playing with these characters a little bit in 2010 there was a real glut of just making content like that because dvds were still selling and iplayer was trying to do all sorts of stuff so people would just make stuff i don't think those like five diaries because there's only five there's not one for the finale would have taken long at all long at all to have um made i I think it might have just been a bit of having fun but they're an interesting watch shanks actor you can he uh you can look up his doctor who audition on youtube he auditioned for sylvester mccoy the part that he eventually got the seventh doctor um yes well i must say that the logic of that eludes me for the moment logic will always elude you i can see that I see what you are now. You're a clown. You're dressed as a clown. Actually, in my experience, the biggest clowns 
are the people in uniforms. You can see, like, he had a right old go at it. Like, it was a pretty decent audition. I, he was, I found it, he gave a sort of creepy performance. And, like, the Seventh Doctor is kind of creepy anyway. And I feel like if this guy got the part, it would have been even, like, quieter and sort of more sinister. But, um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. That's really fascinating. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And I have always seen Shank as being, if Neil Cross were to write a Doctor, I think that it would, I think he would be very similar to Shank. Yeah, it yeah. was but it was Sylvester Shank and then the third audition was a man with a like a perm and a mustache who does not look or act like an actor. Like he's just stiff as a board and <laughs> apparently he's good in other things, but his audition was just terrible. Um but yeah, those are cool if you ever have the time to look them up. Do we have any other thoughts on the third episode? I don't. Oh, I was just going to say that Luther in the beanie and the sunglasses is a a, a mood. So Luther and Alice get this moment um where Luther, for the first time, goes to Alice for help. Uh, he needs help in catching Burgess. And he asks her to, to help him to get into the mind of a man like this because he, he has not confronted someone so evil. Which, to be fair, I can believe, given how fucked up Burgess is. Um, and she, her recommendation is the line, change the state of play. Um, which is not quite... There's, there's not much of interest to be said about that in this episode, but I think it's something that comes up time and time again, not just in the rest of the season, but in the rest of the show. I think that change the state of play is something that really stuck with Luther and um, had an effect on his uh, policing. So Al Alice actually, I think, had a real effect on the way that Luther catches his criminals. That is that the scene where he goes to consult with her in like the sciencey room? That's yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me, uh, Ruth Wilson herself uh, brought up the comparison to the Silence of the Lambs. Here's another Hannibal connection. It reminded me of Silence of the Lambs, but what this did was turn it on its head by having a female psychopath interacting with the male police detective. In one of the extra things on the DVD, Idris Elba points out. Uh, that Luther doesn't ever change his clothes, like his yeah. uniform, and he says it's like a comic book character. Uh, and he also <laughs> he says uh, Ripley is the Robin uh, to his Batman. I was going <laughs> to say that earlier, but I didn't. But yeah, he 100% is. He's so like, oh, gee, oh, shucks, like that kind of guy. I think Luther's character is particularly well-defined and has the potential to be iconic. My character is a little less British and more superhero than normal, I think. He never changes his clothes. He's like an action hero from start to finish. Warren Brown playing Ripley, he's not going to like me saying this, but he is Luther's Robin. Me being Batman, of course. Anyway, uh, episode four is. Well, actually, I think this one plays into the comic booky stuff we're talking about because I think this is one where I more got a sense of the kind of Gotham sense of Luther's London because it's so... It's not just that it's dilapidated. Uh, like Tyler talked about how the very first episode starts with the deindustrialization, and it's, So it's not just that it's like a post-industrial wasteland. It's also the the frequency of crazy criminals. Uh and it, this is talked about on the extras as well, but this is in no sense, like, realistic how many strange psycho killers they're getting in s such short proximity to each other. But it's not- I don't think it's just that part of that's how a TV works. I think it does build up kind of a sense that this London is kind of like a, a Gotham. It, it, it's kind of this wasteland of uh, psychosis and s sadism. So, so yeah, it all kind of coheres together, the, um, the, the comic booky stuff to me. And I don't think Batman is a facile comparison at all. I think the show invites it. Uh, you know, Idris Elba talks in those terms himself. But the specific crime of this episode is another really sexual one. And it's that guy who uh, is, like, killing ladies and then taking their jewellery and then bringing the jewellery home to his, his, his partner who's played by uh, an actress that McGann knows very well because he's done like over a decade of <laughs> Doctor Who uh, audio dramas with her. 
Nicola Walker. Nicola Walker, yeah, who uh, is really good. I think she's a really good actress. She is fantastic, yeah, and this is um, so different, such a different performance from her Doctor Who audio performance, which yeah. I was I was never able to to drive with, um, and I understand the thinking of, uh, and I understand why she plays it that way, especially after so many years of doing it. But even even in the beginning, it was it was always quite understated. Um, and I just don't feel that it works for audio. I, th- I think she's too similar. It's. Do you remember uh, in 2013, uh, Jenna Coleman was really introduced with this kind of line that she can talk just like Matt Smith. She can talk just as fast as Matt Smith. She can quip just as fast as Matt Smith. And I think uh, Nicola Walker is also really similar to McGann. In, she's really, in the kind of twisted line deliveries she does, the kind of understated subversions of how the lines you'd think would be played she does that a lot which is great but i don't think it really works for me it doesn't really really work when they're like the two leads of a show or of like an audio series together because they're both playing things so similarly that it's like between two leads like you look at luther and alice and they're so different and so you get so many great sparks and dynamics off that i think mcgann's doctor and um liv's character the nicola walker's doctor who character their literal performances are so similar that I think it's it feels kind of static at times. But in this, uh, you know, she's a guest character, so she gets uh, room to play around, and she doesn't have any scenes with McGann, so it's fine. She's the perfect actress for this because this role is one where most of the things that she's, um, most of the sense that you get from this character are not in the dialogue whatsoever. So this is an actress who, to, to take on this role, you have to understand that you need to, and this is what actors do anyway, but you need to be perfectly willing and ready to read between the lines of every single thing and not only read between lines, but create your own sense of what this character is doing and, and thinking and feeling because that can't really show in the script. Um, so it's it's great that N- Nicola Walker is able to convey so much um emotion so much anxiety yeah um and and she's in and she's she's capable of doing this thing where she's speaking a line um and saying it with with a level of um like she she does believe what she's saying but it's her face is reading completely differently yeah i think this is why oh it's why a lot of shows seek her out but i think why in particular something like doctor who loves it so much is she does these kinds of performances which bring a reality to the scripts that I often don't think is there on the page. She makes it feel real and makes it feel normal and makes it feel thought out in a way I don't think the actual lines are necessarily delivering, but she's delivering those kind of complexities and contrasts between how she's delivering something and how she's looking. Yeah, uh, really good actress. Yeah, and this is a great character and a really memorable one for me, one, one, yeah. that, I've, one that stands out for me even um, in, the, in the full five seasons of Luther um, because this is not Cross's character. This is not Cross's genius. Um, it's almost entirely N- Nicola Walker's, um, and she is fantastic at it. Uh, just, just constantly. I the 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 level of tension in this episode for me is not so much in what is written in the script and the and the the, the tense nature of what is about to happen. It's it's almost entirely in the way that Nicola Walker is reacting to these things playing out. Speaking of her reacting. At the very start of our conversation, uh, Tom Tit brought up Broadchurch, uh, and there's a scene in this episode uh, where Nicola Walker finds out the stuff that her husband has been doing, and it reminded me a lot of like what I'd consider the climax of our uh, Broadchurch series one, where it's where a character finds out something, uh, and they get to do a huge performance uh, based off that kind of realization, and they get to try and inhabit it in a very like showy but like how a person would react to such a world changing uh, realization uh yeah and she does she does good work in that scene watching this episode made me think that nicola walker kind of deserves to be as big as olivia coleman i think oh i 100 percent, yeah just based on like how much she's able to convey in this but i think the reason she isn't is because like this might sound like a knock on nicola walker when actually i mean it as the exact opposite but watching her can be quite actually depressing because yeah her pain is so real and you just get like the weight of all the years she's spent with this guy and you just feel it and it's like actually really sad and like really human and it's like quite a lot to take in um but yeah she was like 
really quite scarily good in this, I felt. Walker is so great and so so consistently real that um it it just it feels like watching uh naturalism and and so so much um so many things that are unsaid but you can see on the screen and it's it's just she's she's an absolute gold mine. I think uh she would have done absolute wonders uh with the ninth doctor character in particular. I know I talked about her performance similar to McGann's, but I think she would have been able to do what Equiston did like just as well the inhabiting this crazy wacky sci-fi backstory of like uh big ma- magic wars and stuff but inhabiting it in such a lived-in way i think she would have crushed uh that character it's you know she, i know she's a companion but i th- i think she would have absolutely crushed it as a lead for that uh, realization of the doctor in particular i can see that and that's like not something i would have necessarily thought of like myself but now that you said i can totally see it and because she's very funny too like yeah chalk obviously like yeah no that would have been good a cool point to make here, actually, is that she was probably at the height of her fame around 2005 because she had been um, one of the leads of Spooks since 2003. And Spooks was the show that Neil Cross went on to, you know, to, to work for. Um, so, so yeah, Nic- Nic- Nicola Walker was was at the height of her fame around 2005. I want, I, want, I hope she was brought up at least in conversation at least once. And yeah, like Tom t- said, she was in Chalk that... Uh, late nineties Stephen Moffat comedy, uh, and she was very funny in that with D- David Bamber as the lead. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> we only have praise to sing uh, for this actress. This kind of this kind of comes back to our episode one discussion when we were talking about the tension with Luther actually d- does believe in goodness, and it's not just a narcissistic t- detective thing what he does, and how uh, Tom was knitting it together, saying the narcissism in episode two, the narcissism and the goodness are kind of one and the same because he, that's how he sees himself as effective. Uh, I think this episode plays a lot on us seeing that Luther really does value human life in a, in a like a really strong way. Yeah, he he genuinely values human life, and it pains him personally and physically when people are killed. Um, and I do think it is is in a sense because we've already spoken about this for his own ego and it is in a sense performative but it is also really clearly very true of him and it, and it, it it is um i think he's too emotional for the job i don't think he he actually and i think that's something that obviously we get from the first the first instance of of meeting him he's he's not he's not right for the job that he's in he's too emotionally attached he can't let go of people being hurt and the and the idea of people who hurt people needing to be punished um and he's just too involved in it whereas people like teller and i know that we've i'm sure we'll come back to this but i know we've kind of already written her off as a <laughs> as a bit of a you know it's a good boss but terrible decision maker um she's a good cop and she's a good cop because she's professional because she knows how to just deal with situations she can put herself into a situation that for most people um most people would find really quite disturbing and 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 traumatizing and just kind of shut her brain off to it but luther can't luther is traumatized by all of the instances of death in the show <laughs> this feels so facile in response to that but i just remembered in this episode we get a literal eccleston road uh in in some of the driving <laughs> stuff yeah. so, so there you go yeah i th- i think that cross is a is a doctor who fan isn't he so i i wouldn't put it past him for for that to be yeah an insert on the cockaldry stuff, uh, it just strikes me again that we have this thing where uh, Nicola Walker's character and the dopey killer husband, and then there's the guy. I, I know this actor because he's in um he's in the Wheel of Time. He's a good actor. The guy with a huge grin who she's actually sleeping with. Uh, we get another little triangle, uh, and I love the kind of beats of how Nicola Walker has sex with the creepy husband. And it kind of fucks up the relationship with the guy that she's having an affair on on him on because of the belief that he's like sexually inactive, but he's had this sexual awakening through the killings. It's interesting that we get the cuckoldry thing played in a different sort of way with these characters. I just I just like this idea. I think I'm I'm fascinated by this idea that it's like the husband has cuckolded the guy that she's actually having the affair with because their marriage is at a dead bedroom uh, for so long. It, it seems. Did the episode kind of make you, uh, like, feel gross watching it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I found it very um, too real, almost. Like, 
Yeah, I don't know. It wasn't wasn't exactly what I'd call pleasant. I think there's a lot of long dialogues in this episode too, which is a nice cross thing. Like he's very, it's, it's I think it's a real joy in this genre is to have a big long dialogue, usually in interrogation rooms, but not always a big long dialogue of just two actors being great. Uh, it's something, it's it's kind of theatrical, but it's something you get in, in cop shows a lot. And it's it's a nice thing to see it played well and played with the confidence just to have no tricks or anything, but just two actors in a room talking uh, for ages. Uh, that's another thing, if I just want to heap praise on, <laughs> on this episode that I liked about it. But something, uh, I wouldn't really call it a flaw, but I think is an interesting little wrinkle in the episode is Luther is not really present in the big climax stuff at the end much at all and you brought up to me uh you were curious if maybe this was an intentional thing or if it was a scheduling thing like was there a reason Idris couldn't meet those days of filming because I, I think the episode works enough that you don't really notice it too much but he's entirely absent from all the the house stuff with the killer and uh and the sex work and everything uh towards the end uh, which is interesting. Yeah, I couldn't figure it out because it's very expertly done. If it was a case of, you know, it just, just couldn't make it to, to to do this and that they had to just kind of do, do a, a little bit of um, rejigging exactly how the climax plays out. It's it's like a Graham and Doctor Who thing. A, a, a great Graham? Graham is, uh, Bradley is much less availability, so he's always getting subplots, uh, so he has to film less. Well, he used to anyway. Oh, I don't even... <laughs> Yeah, no, that, it is. Yeah, it kind of it's it's very it's done in a way that um, you almost don't notice it. Um, but he isn't actually present at all. He's he's what 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 Elba is doing is is recording his scenes entirely separately from literally every other actor, um, and he's just delivering a phone call. It's like a Doctor Light episode where like Matt Smith or David Tennant just do all their scenes in a TARDIS in like a day and then they're off and that's that's how they make the episode work like blink I think the thing that's great about it is that it kind of it, it's nice to see Luther uh sort of housebound you know in the sense that he's he's normally like the center of the action or, or even going in alone um to make the arrest as we saw with with Owen Lynch but here every other cop from his nick is gone and he's the one that has stayed behind um so that's that's quite an interesting thing. I think it's also smart to have Ian play a little more of a role in a climax in this episode before the uh, finale two-parter. Yeah, and we get the classic Ian thing, I just want to go home. And that's, yeah. uh, and that's something that I'm sure that we'll bring up in episode six. But in almost every episode, Ian has some kind of line evoking he's so tired and he just and he's sick of his job and he just wants to get home and be done with it all. The actor for The Killer, I have trouble talking about just because I find him so repellent and i he 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 he, he just looks right to me like i really i buy <laughs> this character like a thousand percent like everything about him the dagginess but the the, the awfulness it just he, he rings so true to me that i have trouble like even praising him because i don't want to talk, talk about him at all <laughs> it makes me out too much uh but yet yeah, him bashing down the door it's just terrifying yeah and the, the what an ending to the episode with uh, with um, Nicola Walker's character, you know, hammering the nail there. Yeah, That's- God, yeah, it's just great. And it's so cathartic and c- both cathartic and heartbreaking because you know that she's literally lost everything and is now going to prison for his crimes, really. She, she's she's now going to serve his time. Um, but it's also really cathartic in the sense that you've wanted her to to do something about him the whole time and finally she does get that moment it's uh, it's it's just great. It's just so great all round. I really can't fault it at all. There's there's two other things in this episode. I think worth talking about. <laughs> One is Mark. Um, there's that great. We were laughing at him earlier for how Alice kind of toys with him. And there's that scene where she's outside of his place, uh, doing like the sexual finger gesture at him to um clue him in uh, to, to what's going on. And so we got we got a lot of big Mark uh, moments in the episode. Like there's uh. Is this the one where he's at the table with um with Zoe, um and and he gives a like the ultimatum, uh of you have to make up your mind, uh, and again it's just Mark is mature and he thinks things through in a way that a lot of other characters don't, and also in a really real way he like asks very like and he's not just saying this he really is thinking about it. What do you want to Zoe? And he's not just like saying it as an accusatory thing. I think he's genuinely trying to get her to like work through what do you want. It's a, I think it's a very caring thing, actually, how he presents what he's saying to her. 
Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned the the scenes that he has with Alice, and I th- I think that um, those scenes are a real credit to uh, Ruth Wilson's ability as an actress um, because you you can put her in a scene with with any other character, just just her and another character alone, and she will literally always steal the spotlight. Um, and it's uh, it's it's just for, she's like the goddess of this show. Um, just understands the, the the workings of it perfectly, and can literally be confronted by any single character, and just be perfect, <laughs> be exactly what you need her to be in that scene. It's the dream part of the show, like the big showy, uh, crazy sexual killer. But it's also she does it so well that it's, it's it doesn't feel like a gimmick to me at all. She's she's amazing. Yeah, it's it's kind of. Um it's kind of a disservice to her to say that the, that the part is trite because in a way it is, but I think it's a really hard part to play um, because it's not your typical uh, crazy psycho killer woman uh, um, that you, that you kind of get with, with typical uh, slightly misogynistic writers similar to cross. I think cross is slightly, slightly more highbrow than that. And what he does with Alice is a bit more uh, nuanced and she's capable of these um, flipping between these, these moments of, warmth and empathy uh and then re- real coldness and, and callousness and evil within the same breath um and you know do, doing do all of this th- these great metaphors and and implications um while also being very on the nose or doing something else entirely that i, I think it takes a lot of skill to, to perform this role and i think that that it wouldn't have worked with an actress it wouldn't have worked at all with an actress that doesn't have the immense skill that wilson has I think she. I think she makes the show. As I don't think there'd be. There's no show without her as well. This is like the the. This is like the focal point of the show. What makes it really interesting beyond, like Luth is a great character, but it's 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 this it's this character, of Alice that yeah invests all the energy and life into it. I, I think she is the crux. Yeah, and I think um, Cross is aware of that. I, I might have to like voice some degree of dissent here. Oh, go on. Because this is sort of the episode which. This is sort of the episode which made me, like, consider to myself, is Alice really kind of, in essence, a male fantasy, like, of a character? And is she a manic... Like a manic pixie? Manic pixie dream girl, exactly. Because it's just the way she sort of floats in and out of episodes when it's relevant for Luther. Um, And you really don't get the sense that she has any kind of life when she's not having her bits in the show. And it's also, like, just the way that she dresses up like David Bowie in this. <laughs> and um, I'm just sort of, like, not 100% sold on the on the veracity of her as a person. That's I, It's really interesting you say that because uh, that reminds me. For warning, I, this is from a DVD extra done contemporary with Series 1. So I have no idea <laughs> if, if this connects to anything later. No one yell at me if this actually is a... Sp- uh, a, a retroactive spoiler <laughs> I don't think it is but in the big DVD extra making of thing Ruth Wilson talks about something really relevant to what you're saying Tom uh, she suggests this idea um, she says Alice kind of appears sometimes like she's a figment of Luther's imagination or like she's an apparition just relevant uh, to Luther I think there are quite a few ways you could probably play Alice you know she's a physicist so you could go down the route of her being quite geeky and originally that's how some of us thought it might go. But I don't know, I had an idea that she was almost too perfect. She was untouchable. She was someone that you'd see, you'd be struck by because she was quite striking or very striking, but you'd never see her again. So we, we moved very quickly away from mousy Alice, it could have been, to a very strong, strident, powerful, frightening in that way. But she's also sexy. There is a great irony that a man who seeks to uphold the law, should find his strongest ally in a woman who he knows to be a killer. Everyone needs to be fascinated with something or somebody, and I think Alice is Luther's fascination. And his imagination, I think. Is she, or isn't she, part of Luther's imagination? Is she real? Is she not real? Is she an apparition? Is she the devil? There's a scene of me walking around him um, where I'm sort of toying with him. And then we did it without me being there. So as if he was talking to himself. We asked him the lines off camera. So that's a really interesting from, from what you're saying. It's like the character you can see is just growing out of the, 
the, the, the needs of Luther or the story needs related uh, to Luther more than an independent actor, uh, which I think we can see Mark as in some ways, like we were just talking about him. That's interesting to describe her in that way. And I'm curious, uh, don't, don't tell me, but I know later seasons have less episodes and this season has the most episodes. And so this season gets more of the like the killer of the week episodes. So I'm curious if in later seasons, maybe she's more focal just by virtue of their probably being less killer of the week episodes, probably being more arc central stuff. So I'm curious what shakes up there as well. I might laugh at this comment later. Who knows? Talking about her presence in the show reminds me of uh, some stuff that DP was talking about in the extras as well. And that is the show uses a muted color palette with like one point, like the, it'll have one strong color focus in scenes when it has them. So there's Zoe's red door. Uh, sometimes there's red phones, uh, like in the office, but of course, Alice, her lips and even more so her hair are like the, the focal points of shots because we'll have this all muted color palette and then this one, you know, bit of brilliance, this one bit of brightness within them. The color palette is, is generally quite muted and quite timeless. The color scheme is based on a neutral color scheme where you'll have a small amount of very strong color in the palette. The rest of the colors will come from grays, but they'll be highlighted by the stronger color. And you'll see there's some nice, uh, some little kicks of red, such as like the you know, kind of alarm systems and the uh, fire extinguishers, and kind of zing out, and, you know, in their in their own way. That's why we went for the bright red hair as well of my character, because it then it created the colour palette that there's sort of red the lips, the hair, and every now and then there's in shots there's bits of red around. I think it's interesting to think about that and the kind of manic pixie stuff of like how you play a character as an object or not, like in a show. Like it's interesting that. She's, she's even conceived in visual terms as like being the, the balance between the muted world around Luther and then she's like the, the bright thing within it. Um, yeah, I think her presence and the way it's dealt with is, is, is quite interesting. I wonder whether now might be the time to bring up um, your take, Neo, on uh, the theme, Par Paradise Circus by Massive Attack. Um, your theory was, was, I believe, that it related to luther and alice's relationship perfectly and i think the reason i bring this up now is because of that that lyric um eyes like a flame but there are several lyrics the love you like a fly um yeah there are several lyrics that you said related to their relationship so this was just my intuitive read when i first heard the episode so what we have love is like a sin my love i don't know how you want to characterize alice and luther's relationship right now but it, it certainly seems sinful to be consulting you know a killer like this uh, look at her with eyes like a flame. She will love you like a fly. Will never love you again. Like a fly, it's that Silence of the Lambs kind of thing again, the way Alice perceives people. It's like the the the, the, the toying, like how a cat will toy with a mouse, you know, um, like torturing it to, to wear it out. I think there's that aspect of how Alice deals with people. Uh, Luther, in a different way than to someone like Mark, who is absolutely her like a spider to a fly or like someone picking the wings off a fly is how she treats Mark. With Luther, it's more complicated. Alice has got this presence to me that's uh, very similar to, in a lot of early modern drama, you'll find characters who, you know, Shakespeare will have done this a lot. You'll have seen um, like Marlowe, um, certain others, where a character will be more uh, in tune and uh, sort of speak to the audience more often than they speak to their counterparts the other the other characters it's, it's like the entire thing is their relationship with the audience more is more important than their relationship with the characters um and this and obviously this is not specifically an early modern drama thing it's just because that's just because i study it, that's where it came from this thought but you can see it in um uh i've, I've recently finished fleabag you can see, so it's still a thing that that we do Something you know, this this breaking the fourth wall and characters relating better with their audience than they do with other characters. And I think that Alice has that presence where she has all of these relationships with all these other characters and she's playing them all off of each other, but she understands everything perfectly. She understands exactly what's going on, exactly what has happened, what will happen, what every character is thinking and what they all mean. And the amazing thing that she can do is recite what themes mean what exactly she can tell us what exactly cross is doing <laughs> uh so, so cross can tell us via alice exactly what is happening 
at any given point. And it doesn't feel expositionary. It, it feels <laughs> it feels like it's just Alice talking to us <laughs> in a, in the same sense as um, yeah, in, in the same sense as, as various other types of drama that I've mentioned, where a character will just explain things to an audience like we're a friend. We're, their, we're, we're better suited to be their counterpart than the characters that are on stage with them. I think the kind of link with how Tom was talking about it is she feels less like she's in the reality, such as it is, of the episodes uh, than the other characters. And she feels more like she's in this kind of hazy zone between the, the writer and us. Yeah, almost like a narrator in, in a sense. Yeah. Y- yeah. Well, speaking of Alice, in this episode, she does... Um, <laughs> she does something that's a really big deal when she kills Madsen. So that's that that inert drama we were talking about from episode one is short circuited here. Exactly because it, was it a big deal? Is it? It's kind of I forgot about the Madsen thing. I think it's a less interesting execution, a uh, very appropriate word for what something uh, Cross does in the next episode too, where it's like he takes an aspect of the show you think is going to play out in a more traditional way and then he just he cuts it loose he just destroys it um and it's kind of a surprise how he does that i think it's less effective here than in the next episode but i think oh so the madsen stuff isn't going to be the instant the finale is not going to be about oh they found out luther's bad now we've all got to have a big crisis about this it's not that she just completely dispenses with that for him it's almost kind of like tom was saying like the how she's kind of like an object and just like useful to luther it's very much her doing that and the interesting thing is like it's it solves a mechanical issue for him. Like it solves a potential problem in his future, but someone doing that for him is a big deal and a big issue of its own. And their kind of growing connection is its own issue. And that's a really literalized uh, in the in the towards the end of the finale as well. Uh, but yeah, I think basically episode five does the oh this thing you thought was going to be a whole series long thing we're going to cut it short. Isn't that crazy? I think episode five does it better than episode four. Yeah. 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 Uh, any other episode four stuff? Um, yeah, there's a little, little like microscopic bit of writing that I want to admire and appreciate, which comes from that um, the Mark and Zoe table scene that you were talking about earlier, Neo. And it's when after Mark offers the ultimatum and he specifies, although this might actually be an episode five, I can't remember. It doesn't matter that much. But Mark specifies that he doesn't want Zoe to um, ever contact John again. Like, should she choose to stay with Mark? That's what he wants. And the words he chooses to use to make this clear are, it's necessary for me. And, it, like, the fact that he he uses passive sentence construction, like, he doesn't say, I need this. He doesn't really bring himself into it as an active player. He says, it's necessary for me. And I think that's really, like, it, it, stuck, it stuck out to me. And I think it's because it's, like, such a neat reflection of Mark as, like, if you don't like Mark, it's a reflection of how passive he is. And if you do like Mark, you could say it's a reflection of how he's good at de-escalating conflict by not bringing himself into it, by 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 removing it from the actors of the conflict itself. Um, but yeah, I just... Because I think it's important to look at little individual moments of good writing like that. And that was one that I really jumped out at me. I love that. I'm such a fan of when writers have enough of a... They're so clicked into their characters um, and the way their characters talk that they'll they'll do th- clever things with the sentence construction like that. I love those novelists you get who are uh, don't use punctuation, like Cormac McCarthy. And so when you have like a conversation between three characters, they've got to be at such a good level of their characters being individual that the reader will be able to pass who is who with no uh, with no quotation marks, with no he said when it's just words, 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 words. Uh, I love when writers are good enough at characters to do that. And so it's less showy in a TV show. It's less obvious than if a novel was doing it without um, punctuation. But I love that what you've brought to the table there about how he constructs his sentences, Mark. That's so good. Yeah. It is It is such a passive thing. Um, and I, I love how you could read it in a positive and negative way. That's so cool. It also reminds me, there's actually two Mark table conversations in this episode, really. We, we're all talking about the second one. But there's also the earlier one where he starts annoying Zoe with a song which is fun characterization for him, but I also love it because we get a great, like a match cut where uh, Zoe is throwing toast at Mark playfully and they've been having toast. That's like what the scene is. And so they're kind of reunited as a couple and she's feeling more connected to him again with the jokey annoyance stuff he's done. And then we cut to Luther, who's just finishing off a sandwich uh, himself. And he's just alone in his office and he's just wiping his 
uh, fingers on his trousers and he, he just seems kind of sad and lonely and pathetic coming off um, the happy toast couple scene we've just gotten with uh, Zoe and Mark. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how well it's executed because I, I, I remember really disliking the, the Mark Zoe relationship at the time. But I think there is some kind of, I think we, we are supposed to feel that Zoe and Mark are a much better couple and they are the, they and they should be together. I don't think this is um a retrospective uh 2022 thing. I think this is something that was meant to occur. But I also think that the sympathy that is created for Luther and the fact that we're getting the whole show through Luther's perspective kind of it it just it it that nothing can be done about the fact that we are just going to root for Luther anyway. I don't know if you guys feel that way. I I I find myself, despite myself, rooting for Luther that he will get back together with Zoe, and I find myself satisfied when they they have sex in I think it's episode three or four, <laughs> um, and <laughs> I, I, find, I find myself satisfied in the sense of enjoying the the drama unfolding. Before me. Of course, of course. No, I kind of I root for Mark more. Well, that's interesting terming too. I um I am more a Mark's corner here than Luther's. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's a very telling thing about ourselves. Who who we're self inserting as? That's also interesting phrasing. Who we're um who we're, who, <laughs> we're, who we're liking the most in this in this triangle, this rectangle. Uh, I, I for sure root for Mark, and I like Mark a lot more as a guy, and I think that their relationship is much better. But I find I just find myself um, I just I just want. Luther and Zoe, because I, I I think what it is is that I can see that they that Zoe is is not she's happy in her relationship with Mark, but she's yeah she her desire is not for Mark, her desire is clearly for Luther, and Luther's Luther wants and desires Zoe. Mark deserves someone that wouldn't cheat on him, and would I think he deserves someone on his emotional level more? Yeah, so I see where you're coming from. I guess the crack ship would be um Luther and Zoe together, and then we resolve the rectangle with uh, Alice and Mark. And well, the finale yeah. even you know well, <laughs> it does interesting stuff between them. So yeah, yeah. I was uh, um, I'm obviously I'm, I'm reserving this for later, but but there's there's uh, so uh, you had very interesting wording about about what happens to the three of them by the end of this season. Uh, the the way that they they sort of become in, like in a sense of a sort of thruple, <laughs> like they 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 end up sort of in this kind of polycule of like this murder polycule. Yeah. Uh, so episode five. This does something I love. Uh, Doctor Who does this quite a bit. Uh, Dio Dardi, Utopia, Turn Left, where it's kind of like a stealth connector. Like you go into an episode. I went into episode five and I just thought, here, we've got an, an episode of the week again. And for most of the runtime, I think it appears that way. But it's actually, I think you could characterize it as a two-parter, as a, as a piece of a two-episode whole. Uh, and I love when shows do this. I don't know how this episode was promoted back in the day, but it's something I always love in Doctor Who when you're like on episode eight and you're thinking, well, this is another one of the week. And then it connects to a larger story. I think it's a really exciting thing to play with TV structure like that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in this episode that um, it, it really it really starts in what feels like an episode of the week. And then it rooms through that plot so quickly and it morphs into something quite different. Uh which I really like. I like playing with expectations of like week to week structure like that. Uh, yeah, what do you guys think of this episode? Do you think it's a two parter? I would. I call this a two parter. Yeah, a stealth two parter. Sure. Tom silences. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll just go with the agreement. Yeah. Because I, I think you get about half. No, not even that. I think you get about 25, 20 to twenty five minutes in, and then the the, the cogs start turning, don't they? We're, we're like, oh, okay. I, I can see now how this is starting to things are going to start having to bleed through into the next one. And the things that Ian are doing are not going to be resolved in this episode. It's, I loved with this episode. I was thinking like 15 minutes in, this is actually going really quick. Um, and it didn't, it didn't kind of flag me off that it was going to morph into something else, but I was fascinated by how quickly it was moving through what felt like an episode's worth of drama and crime to me. Um, I love that sort of thing where this st structure is played with like that. And the, or even... Not just talking about the ending quite yet, but Ian himself. Um, but I don't even remember his name for the first four episodes. Uh, he felt very much like a background character. Oh, that's just Luther's cop friend. He seems like a okay cop. He's very tired. Don't you think he looks tired? He, he just he wasn't that interesting to me. Um, and I love that when a TV show can have a character there all along, 
and you don't really pay attention to them. And then when it brings them to the fore, it feels kind of organic uh, in, a re- in a really cool way. It feels earned and organic because he's always been there. And for him to take center stage now, I, re- I really like the structure of that. I could would never have guessed in a million years that a finale two-parter was going to be about Ian uh, instead of, you know, the Madsen stuff or whatever else. But I, I thought that was executed really well. I really liked that. What, what, what do we think of the actual, the first half of the episode? So like the crime of the week. Uh, so it's the, the painting stuff, the upper class. They're, they're, I think they're trying to um, smuggle diamonds to sell elsewhere. It's, it's, I don't know. The, the thing that's, that is really interesting to me about this, and I am, I am okay with it, I don't think it's lazy, is um, this is Cross's first white collar crime. And I just don't think that he's interested in it. And that's fine because it only it only serves to you know it's, it it does a, a bit of kind of like you know how the Simpsons will start with the first ten minutes or like you know the, the first five to ten minutes is is one story and then it just kind of evolves into the next. It's kind of like that. That's such a good comparison. Yeah, that's m- most Simpsons episodes are like that. They'll start with like a five minute story and it's almost like a separate thing. And then the next fifteen minutes will be a separate. I've always loved. Yeah, and that just leads into the real story. Yeah. I love that about The Simpsons. I never thought about the connection here, but yeah, that's true. So I think this this being Cross's first and one of the only, if not arguably the only, because I think all of the other white collar criminals are, you know, they've got some kind of weird edge to them, like they're, they're a murderer or whatever in later seasons and this season. So this is the only white collar crime that I can think of in the show. And he is just uninterested in it. And it's what's really funny is that not only is he clearly uninterested in writing it, but he makes it really obvious in the characters because Luther is also not very interested in this. Like he's invested in saving Jessica. Yeah, Jessica. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's interested in saving Jessica and he has real personal stakes in that obviously because he's, he, he wants to save people. That's his whole thing. But when it comes to the actual crime itself, he's, he's very uh, uninterested and in in a way that he's he's been very interested and engaged in all of the other crimes and he's really wanted to, to get to the bottom of it. Whereas with this one, it's kind of like, this is just him. For the first time, we see him just kind of doing his job. This is just normal day work for him um, when it comes to solving the, the crime itself sort of thing. Like he doesn't need to get into the mind of this criminal or anything like that. He just needs to save the person and he just kind of needs to stop the crime because the crime is bad. Not because um, there's some kind of you know, me- meta narrative point about the, the the themes of this type of crime or anything like that. It's just kind of it's it's something to to lead on to the next thing. It's it's not really it's not really important the crime. It's what's important is Ian fucks up. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Seeing the gambits get fucked up in the episode is so interesting. Uh, because if not for Ian's gambit, I think Luther's uh, was working. So the the lack of communication and then both playing their own games to try and solve the crime uh, screwed each other over or well, screwed Jessica over ultimately and the guy the other criminal guy yeah it's a bit of a, a classic um tragedy really I, I i feel that um suddenly and as you say it's it's really surprising that it ends up being ian suddenly you're you're in ian's tragedy where ian is is um his 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 flaw is that he's he's you know he's he's done something awful and he feels awful about it and he's trying to rectify it but he's lost his his he's lost his um his uh trust in his in his friend he, where he could have just gone to luther and just told him um he, f- he feels like that you know this weight of responsibility and he ends up fucking things up worse and this just keeps happening even during episode six idris elba uh characterizes the ian and luther relationship like he says it's like othello and Diego. it's a classic betrayal story and idris likes how it's not overplayed like we were talking about he likes how it kind of runs understated through the series kind of likened reading luther to othello and iago classic classic betrayal story you know we don't overplay it in this we don't overplay the friendship and we don't overplay the betrayal but it's there. And they're old mates, and it's a very male, blokey relationship. They don't sit around and having heart to heart. He's a, a, a good, supportive friend, really. And the thing about friends is sometimes you'll meet two people and they're like, we're best friends. And sometimes you'll see similarities in them. Sometimes you won't, which will make you go, I wonder why they're best friends. And I think with our, we are the latter. They're both driven to try and 
catch these people doing these awful things. They have their own means for doing it and I think they understand that well sometimes you might cross a line here and you might cross a line there. The cause ultimately is good. Yeah I think the only difference in the Othello Iago thing although it's a, it's a great comparison is that Iago is, is evil and, and just kind of is, is um, uh, Yago is a bit more Alice, really, in that, you know, there's there's no real reason that Yago is, is so evil as he is. Um so, you know, Ian isn't evil. Ian actually is a is a he's quite a he's he's got a good set of uh, moral codes, clearly, and and he is he does actually want to do the right thing. He just at some point it is implied that he's he's fallen on a bad path and is intending to to fix things. But yeah, it's i I find it quite tragic. The I uh Luther's gambit in this episode too, it's another you should kill us all on sight. Uh, recording play thing. How he with the with the uh, woman criminal is captured. He's able to use the recording phone recording he's got from the American face guy um, cleverly uh, to to you know frame it kind of uh, deceptively to coax a certain reaction out of her. I love that. It's his it's his classic Luther move. We brought up the Othello Yago thing that that Alba brought up, and I just wonder that. And obviously, it's 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 pretty clear that what Elba was referring to was that Luther is Othello and that Ian is Iago. But is it not more the other way around, in a sense of in 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 the sense that if you see Iago as as Luther and Othello as you know a character who's um, acting on impulse and the and feeling threatened um, and uh, you know jealous and, and need and he, feel, he feels that he has no choice but to do the thing that he's doing and even as he's doing it he's you know crying and, and saying oh why, why did it have to come to this and that's more to me ian but you know it's a, it's you, you can i don't think it's a perfect comparison that the, the, the othello yago thing even in the hotel room um it's ian's the one who's feeling betrayed as well yeah yeah tom uh how are you thinking for this episode i i think for me and I don't really have any particularly like cogent r- reason for why, but this is probably my least favorite of the bunch. And if I had to say why, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was suspecting when when me when me and Tyler were going at length appraising it, and, <laughs> and you were silent. I was thinking, I think this is another issue uh, Tom is having. So I'm not surprised. Yeah, I'm gonna be a hater. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think, and I think it's because, as you point out, Tyler, the first half has this. I find it to be. Um, almost like blasé quality about it like the scene where luther is negotiating with the tattoo guy on the phone is almost sort of comical in the way that luther's just like yeah look you're smart i'm not gonna sort of mess you around (laughs) and then the american guy is literally looking at his watch like yeah i'm gonna you're not gonna catch me and luther's like yeah well i'm not gonna catch you so it's kind of (laughs) i feel the disinterest emanating off of my screen um and as far as Ian goes, I just hate him and like not in like a fun, I hate the villain, his loathsome sort of way. He is such a banal character and I guess that is kind of the point. It's the banality of evil. It's he so easily succumbs to temptation because he's just so like kind of withered and beaten down by his job. Um, but I just find the actor really tepid and um, I don't know. I just, it didn't gel with me. Strangely enough, unlike episode four, the, my favorite part of this episode was the Alice scene in the church i thought that was really good and um tenderly played and it was just very um i don't know felt felt real and earned and and it has some clever inversions in it too like kind of like in episode one you have luther who's sort of the the literary book guy sort of extending an olive branch to alice saying yeah i know about dark matter and etc etc and here you have an inversion of that where alice sort of goes off on one about paradise lost and i thought that was nice um and you know the, all the all the sort of Satan stuff. Weirdly enough, the Satan stuff is much better in this episode than it was in <laughs> yeah. the Satanism episode. And I guess you could see like Ian Reid as a kind of like fallen angel himself. Although it feels ridiculous calling him an angel because, as you say, he he was just a background character, and I don't care about him because he was a boring background character. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry to be such a hater, but yeah, I don't know. It just kind of bored me. Would you say I'm, I'm picking up a vibe of Are you less endeared to being like? strung out or like tricked by cross than maybe uh tyler and i are like i find a i find a kind of joy in being um toyed with as a viewer like i like that this episode tricked me and like the fact that it has a less interesting first half 
and then it shifts. I like that because it's like I was thinking it was one thing and then it's the other thing. And you you seem to more ha- sort of like an inversion. Like an, like an expectations thing. T- Tom, you seem to more have the view of, of like, if it's a boring first half, then the, why should I have to sit through a boring first half? Uh, are, you, are you feeling like a difference in perspective there, maybe? Yeah, to an extent. And I guess, like, I, I, I just, I wasn't even really expecting the first half to, like, pay off in any big way. Like, I wasn't feeling the investment. So when it's changed track onto being about Ian Reid now, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, it's about that time where something should be happening and now it is happening, but I still don't really care. Um, yeah, I don't know. You brought up the um, church conversation with Alice. They're having this conversation. Uh, well, it's, it's been brought up earlier in the series, hasn't it? The, yeah, because the first episode ends with uh, Luther talking about the love stuff with Alice. I think it's great that this is the first time that we see Luther and Alice physically touch in an emotionally intimate way. Um, and it spells out and it doesn't it doesn't strike me as an end to their relationship, although it's presented that way because you know, we know that episode six is coming and and their 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 relationship seems to just blossom further from that. So it, it spells kind of a uh, an interesting path for them, for the two of them to kind of admit it's almost an admission of love of each other. Yeah. She says, I put my liberty at risk because I couldn't bear to see you hurt. So what I did, I did for unselfish reasons. The universe isn't evil. John, it's just indifferent. I think it would have worked better if I got more of a sense that when Alice chose to kill Henry Madsen in episode four, that she was frightened for her own liberty. Whereas when it actually took place, I kind of assumed that, oh, Alice loves chaos. She's she's enjoying this. She's just messing with Luther's life in an, another way. And it's kind of just her MO. But here it's framed as more of a like a real turning point for her and it's an epiphany that she did something uh, purely motivated out of love, basically. And I think this could have been easily solved if you just had more scenes with Alice just on her own where you get into her head more rather than just as a signifier who sort of drifts into episodes every now and then. Um, Yeah. But I liked the scene mostly on the strength of the chemistry of the actors and the interesting setting and uh, Alice's outfit um looks very good it's like, sort of like a different thing from what she usually wears in the show it's more kind of casual i suppose it feels it feels deliberate i i get the comic book sense again because we got green and purple the green hat thing there's like a purple scarf or something she's got on uh across the bright red hair all these big bright i mean it's still very desaturated because it's luther but all these big bright colors and particularly green and purple which are such comic book uh signifies you know the joker uh, all that kind of thing yeah she she really very striking the uh, in that in that scene i think um now might be an ample time to bring up um on the point tom that you made that you don't feel that you saw alice um feeling as though she was sacrificing anything by doing what she did with madison um i think elba has a very different opinion of alice than is actually given to us in the show and this is from um the concept album that he did um between the release of seasons two and three and released i think on the day of or was it a week before or something neo will know better than i about the about the release of this album the murder loves john the concept album came out 15th of december 2015 which was the day of the first series four episode series four okay so sorry my mistake it was between series three and four so between series three and four yeah there's a track in that called um alice loves and it's essentially a um like a love letter from elba to alice and he he's kind of describing what what her character is and what she does and how she feels and the lyrics to this whole album i should add are not great it's it's not musically it's a pretty good album it's pretty solid it holds up quite well lyrically it's quite often really poor but there are some really interesting things to be to be drawn about um Elba's opinions on these characters and the way that they think, because he's clearly very um, intuitive about these characters and he clearly really, really cares about this show and the characters that are in it. So I think, although I might disagree with a couple of th- a couple of the things that he seems to believe, I think that his opinion is, is, is valuable as a, as a, as a, as an associate producer of the show, but B also as, as um, you know, the lead role in somebody who cares very much about Luther. Very, very few actors would, release <laughs> the fact Idris Elba 
released a concept album called the John Luther Character Album. <laughs> this is not a, it's not a normal thing by any means. Yeah. It's a very unique thing for an actor to be so into a character that they badger the showrunner for years demanding that a movie gets made or that they make a concept album themselves. He's so attached to this character. I think it's 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 extremely endearing. I really like it. So so on, on the point that you made, Tom, that you don't feel that she sacrificed anything, you don't feel that there were any stakes for her, that she wasn't afraid or anything, which is definitely also the opinion that I hold. I think that the way that Wilson plays her is that she's completely cold and um, a psychopath in the sense that she's indifferent to the potential consequences of any of her actions. But the way that Elba sees her is, um, I'm going to read you this lyric, uh, she falls for this thing called murder, the fear only takes her further, she tries to hide but it pulls, it pulls, it pulls her back again. And then it kind of continues like that, she lives for this thing called murder, uh, she swears it will never hurt her, she lives the lie but it pulls, it pulls, it pulls her back again, like she's um, at the mercy of murder. One of the great things, just on, on a little tangent, when I talk about this, of this album, is that Elba presents murder um, as it personifies it. So it's not a, it's not really a concept. It's actually a, a character in the show. Murder loves John, and Alice loves murder, and that's what binds the two of them. Um, but Alice is in in Elba's mind this toxic relationship with this personified murder because she she feels drawn back into it almost against her will. It's, it seems he seems to be saying. Um, and that it, it it hurts her and it makes her afraid and, it, and and she fears it, which is not the sense that I get from what Ruth Wilson sees of the character, but it is what Idris Elba sees of, of Alice. What do you guys make of that? Um, I had not heard of this concept album before you have just bringing it up now. And I'm, I am utterly fascinated by that. And I will, I will 100% be listening to that. It reminds me of like, the only other actor I could think of who would maybe do that is William Shatner. I don't know if he has done that. <laughs> yeah. or, or John Barrowman. Or John Barrowman, yeah. John Barrowman. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, all I can think of is that I would love to be a fly on the wall, like in the writer's room between Elba and Neil Cross. Like those conversations I imagine would be yeah. really interesting. I, th- I think this will come much more to the fore when eventually the movie is uh, released. But the fact that there is a kind of... Tension, and when I say tension, I don't mean they dislike each other. I think it's I, I think uh, Luther is enamored. Uh, Luther, God, uh, Idris is enamored by uh, Cross in a lot of ways, but his attachment to the character isn't normal. Uh, it's not. <laughs> it's it's not normal at all, and his attachment to doing a film of the show isn't normal either. Like it's I, I know it's been a long running thing. Uh, Tyre for years has been like laughing with me at how this movie's never going to happen and it just always brings up that he wants a movie to happen and he's like badgering cross for it to happen and this that's gone on for very many years the fact it's actually being filmed now is is uh remarkable this is like Stephen moffat saying that robert bathus is always pestering him for joking about <laughs> yeah. to come back yeah uh I, so i think idris's perspective is really valuable but i think the really interesting thing is that he's so attached to the character that he can have a different view uh than the writer sometimes i think that's part of the magic of the show is if 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 the character was entirely beholden just to cross, I think it would be a less interesting show. The the fact mm. that Idris has this attachment to it means he's gonna really think through his performance and evolve it in fascinating ways. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, with the Alice stuff, yeah, I don't know. He yeah, I I don't I don't know either because I'm not sure that I well I, I know that I don't agree with it. I know that I see Alice as a completely different character to that. She's she's um, cold and calculated and and psychopathic in that she doesn't care about consequences. Um, so I don't read her the way that he reads her. But also with, um, there's the, the title track, Murder Loves John. Um, and you can you can discern this just from the title. Um, the philosophy of this song, that in, lyrically, seems to be that murder is something that surrounds John and he can't escape. Um, and I think that's also really interesting because that's not at all what I get from his performance or from Cross's writing. In the show, what I get is a man who puts himself constantly in the cross in, in the crossfire of, of murder, He's always putting himself in, in, the, in the line of sight of murder if we're personifying murder. Murder is, is something that he is always approaching. He lives to he lives he lives and breathes it, and he's fascinated by it. Um, not only in, in stopping it, but I think in a way um, 
just buy it. Just buy. I think he has like a morbid uh, interest. This character in murder, um, and like a, and feels that he has personal stakes in it. But yeah, Elba sees it as as being something that is constantly circling him, like like vultures, um, and he just can't escape murder. And and John is trying to. One the, the refrain of the song is "Run, run, run, John," as if you know, run. He's constantly trying to run away from murder, and maybe that's. I think there's a sense of that later on in the show, but certainly not in uh, season one. So I suppose maybe this this would be good to reflect on by season three, th- seasons three and four. But I still really don't even get the sense by that point that what John actually wants is to escape murder. I, I, I think what he is always doing is, is putting himself in it something because we brought up suicide a lot in episode two uh the there's the scene of ian uh when he's uh, screwed things up with well you know in the first half he screws up the would-be killer of the week thing and in the second half pre the ending um he screws up that confrontation with luther in the hotel room he thinks luther's making a play a big mess happens there goes to a park with some vodka or something and his gun uh and he puts it to his head and he tries to kill himself for a while and his hand's shaking and he gives up on it. He's so stressed in this moment. Uh, it's interesting, we get another big suicidality scene there after episode two played with that in its climax as well. Uh, yeah, any thoughts on Ian in, in that context of that scene? Why doesn't he... It's it's interesting to me because he comes close to killing himself. Like, he puts a gun to his head and then in the end of this episode and the next episode, he's v- such survival instinct to, to the point of really screwing over his friend, uh, Luther, and doing a lot of really bad things. Uh, so it's interesting, he comes very close to killing himself, and then he goes completely the opposite direction, and he starts selling out everything uh, just to try and stay alive. Yeah, and I suppose that's the decision that he makes in that moment that, that we're implied to, that, 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 that is implied to us, and, and we are supposed to accept that in that moment he was you know, so depressed that, that all he was going to do was just drown his sorrows and then probably die. But at some point between that scene and, and the next scene with, with Ian at work, he's decided that what he's going to do is continue fighting to to survive and could just continue fucking things up worse. Um, and it's horrible and it's cruel. Um, but it's also, I completely kind of sympathise. I have a lot of sympathy for Ian um, because I, I think it's, um, it is an accident. He's, he's in this really horrible accidental situation um, and he just can't stop making things worse. And I think a better um, Shakespearean comparison, if we're going to make one, uh, than Othello and Iago is Macbeth. There's this moment where Luther, uh, where Ian says, um, "It's like my mind's full of spiders," or something like that, which echoes that, that which echoes the, the Macbeth quote, "O full of scorpions is my mind." Um, so I, I think that's that's the, that, that's the the moment that that's what we're trying. That's what we're he's trying to. Uh, compel us to see is that he's just a, a man fighting for survival in the same way that, that Macbeth from a, after a certain point was. Ian, he's got that fish vibe with his eyes, doesn't he? The kind of dead, yeah, disconnected. Or he and Teller both just, they sort of just seem to sink into the background. Like they don't have any presence, um, which is odd. I I don't know the casting for the show, but I assume Teller is <laughs> is not going to be around by like the movie or series five or whatever. Um, it doesn't feel like a character worth retaining. That's really. Can you elaborate on that? Because I, um, when I first watched the show, well, it's just I think um, Luther is obviously the show. Luther and Alice. I think everyone else you could leave. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And I think you could soft reboot the show pretty easily in a different unit or a whole different concept as long as luther and alice were in it and even then i could theoretically see a version of the show without alice um i wouldn't want it but i could see it functioning enough to continue being made but i think the show is them basically back to the ian stuff in the hotel confrontation when like luther isn't trying to pull one on him the way he's perceiving it it makes me think of like earlier in the episode luther does the you should kill us all on site rearranging footage trick uh, and Lean says, I know you so well, you know, you, you're, you're always got a plan or something. It shows, it's kind of like that boy who, who cried wolf thing almost. Like Luther does his manipulative tricks so much that Ian would just assume that he's being manipulated. I think because Ian's very paranoid, of course, in this scene as well. It's interesting. So we see earlier in the episode, 
uh, he does the regular trick on the phone with the criminal in the boring conversation uh, Tom poked at where he can make people f- make that appearance of understanding and like Luther's a regular guy, but Ian is so used to that because he's worked with him for so long that he's too paranoid. Anything you say can be used against you is like the is like the Luther thinking. That's why he likes to keep people talking. I know an interesting thing with Ian also is um what a, the Satanist episode had a fake out with Ian being a crooked cop as well. Um, of course he wasn't in that scenario. Like it was a joint play. But when he like calls up the Satanist and is like, "You got to clean your boat, man, because they're onto you." Um, give me some money for telling you this. I think coming back to what uh, Tom specifically said in episode two joining the narcissism of luther with his moral goodness like he has to stay he has to not kill himself because he's the only one who can you know save the goodies from the baddies it's interesting to me what ian's issue with getting arrested is in this episode and it's that murderers could go free because his cases would get re-examined uh so i thought that was an interesting place for his mind to go that the work he's done jailing criminals is at risk if his criminality is exposed yeah, that was the only part of the sort of Ian plot that really twigged my interest because it sort of like ties into what I feel with this show is a kind of desire that like Cross and maybe Elba because like it's hard to know exactly what Elba thinks because his contribution to the show is so sort of instinctual and it's the embodiment of the character. But it's like the general desire that the upholding of the law should be more like just the Wild West and not have all this like red tape and the R word regulation uh, around it. Um, And it's, yeah, the idea that like, if you take Ian Reid down, then yeah, everything he's done is called into question as well. Um, And the sort of condemnation of that idea was interesting. It's worth noting that the only criminal that would be released or could be released as a result of Ian being caught would be Burgess, that we know of. The only one that we've seen would be Burgess because every other criminal... Um, Luther is not actually caught. He's, you know, he's known that it was them, and he's led the police onto them. But in some way, they've they, they've either died or he's failed in. Uh, so with the the, the the Lynches, for example, he catches Owen Lynch, but Owen refuses. What well, who they 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 self professedly want is is Owen's dad. Yeah, uh, and he doesn't. They, they don't get him. Um, so that's episode two. Episode three is Burgess. They get Burgess. Episode four is uh, the cabbie. The cabbie dies, and they they end up they end up getting Nicola Walker instead. And she didn't, you know, obviously deserve it. And I think Luther feels that way. Um, so we haven't actually seen Luther win. Really, we've seen we've only seen him win with Burgess. I, I guess it's that more disconnected. Just oh, they've obviously done cases outside of the episodes we viewed thing, but it does make it feel less personal. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's well, it's it's more of a of a thing of um, what it means for Luther the character that he's so emotionally invested and, and he's so willing to break the rules that so often he doesn't actually bring justice. He just kind of he just kind of fucks things up more a lot of the time. That's that's the impression that I get from from those uh, two or three cases where things just went awry where he didn't actually manage to and Jessica didn't save her and that wasn't his fault but but there is so often in his in his career um that he's not actually able to bring any kind of justice so it might be a show about um disagreeing with with too much regulation and too much red tape so to speak but without it Luther is is kind of consistently failing to do his job just a little note you know when Ian is dumping the body uh, in that setting with the huge mounds in some industrial area and he's on the phone to Luther like, oh, John, I'm, you know, everything's fine. Uh, how about you? Um, I don't know if it's the same place, but it looks so much to me like, <laughs> you know, when John Sim and David Tennant are on these huge mounds yeah. in the end of time on <laughs> Doctor Who, but, which uh, was, um, you know, only a year, pro- well, not even a year. It was a few months prior because 2009, 2010. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same place, but it recalled that to me. Yeah. It's a shame uh, Luther wasn't physically there and we couldn't have had like a similar uh, <laughs> <laughs> battle of the yelling in the mines there. Oh, also, uh, before we talk about the ending, uh, something else interesting, in the hotel confrontation where Luther's like, yeah, I might have done some stuff wrong, but I've never killed anyone. 
and Ian's like, not for lack of trying. It's like, it, that's also such a Batman thing to me. Like, it's, it's such a superhero thing, especially Batman. The really literal focus on, did a criminal die? That's that's yeah. like the very specific. It's not anything. It's this kind of comic book world where, you know, the complications, you know, someone died of injuries sustained in a thing or, you know, going to prison is bad as well and all these other things. It's this very literal, like, I've never killed anyone. That's the one red line, you know, uh, that must not be crossed. So I thought that was interesting. It's the, it reminded me of that Batman morality stuff. Yeah, the surface level of the whole show show is that you know police procedures that that prevent criminals from being caught uh, uh, as soon as possible are bad, and uh, Luther is heroic because he evades those and he will do whatever it takes, and he never physically harms anybody to to a bad extent. But the fact that he is consistently losing that's the surface level of it, and that's kind of what you get when you when you first watch it. But when you actually think about what happens in the show the reality of it is very different and luther is constantly failing and he's not so much of this hero as as even even we we, we feel that he is but you you give it like a minute's thought and you realize what, what actually is he achieving by being the way he is he's just harming himself and others should we talk about the ending yet yeah i don't think there's much more to say uh i want to hear tom's perspective first on the ending so ian goes to zoe's place red door house uh she offers him the choice of drinks things get frantic she's made to call luther she blabs out ian and gives luther the truth that ian's there with a gun and he's trying to do some play on luther uh luther rushes against time to get there um hijinks ensue ian kills zoe luther shows up it's very intense um ian runs away Luther gets his hand bloody with Zoe's corpse, and so he runs away because the cops will think Luther did it. He runs into the rain. Yeah, so Zoe died unexpectedly. What do we, what what do you think of this ending, Tom? Yeah, well, um, I think it's really lame, and um, <laughs> it felt it was it's just so like, like callous, um, narratively, like just to sort of dispatch such a central character at the hands of a character who throughout the whole series I felt really didn't have any sort of presence um and it felt really lazy like Luther has already seen enough to know that the world is like a cruel and indifferent place he doesn't really need that lesson taught to him again just in a worse way I felt like I didn't feel like it was breaking any new ground certainly it wasn't breaking any new ground like just in the history of sort of the way women are treated in fiction and crime fiction. Um, yeah, not a fan. That, it's what interest, That's what I was talking about earlier. I was swirling around it where a thing happened that I didn't expect to happen. And part of that was just because I'm kind of used to these days, fridging gets called out when fridging happens. Uh, but this was written, this was done like 12 years ago. And, and you know, it, it still happens today. It just gets yelled at more. But I, th- I thought it was interesting for my experience that I this never I never entertained this idea of her dying just because I I've I wouldn't think of a show uh, functioning that way these days. But if this isn't these days. I don't know how Cross would write series one now if we lived in a very alternate universe with zeppelins and whatnot. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. How I was surprised by it because it's something you wouldn't think you would be surprised by because it is so common. But that's kind of why I like counterintuitively didn't expect it. Uh, but yeah, it's surprised me i was very shocked tyler what's your thoughts on zoe's death and the scene in general i always find it uh really effective um in what cross is trying to achieve and i don't think what he's trying to achieve is teaching luther a lesson about how bad the world is i think that what he's doing here is showing luther the result the consequences of his actions and showing luther that Although this is not directly his fault, it is. It, it kind of feels like a culmination of all of the things, all of the failings that, that I've just been t- talking about. I think that, in a way, this is something that Luther has brought about himself. And Elba would say that, you know, this is something that is it's just tragic, and 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 Luther is surrounded by murder. But I I think this is something that he I think he he brought this about. I think he he manifested this, if you like. And I understand that, um, and also, to be honest, agree that it was not entirely necessary and it doesn't, and the optics of it are not good. 
Um, and the fact that Zoe, uh, I don't feel that she was, but I, I appreciate that, that, that Tom and I think many people do feel that Zoe was shafted uh, throughout the, sh- the season. Shot, really. It doesn't quite... It, it it doesn't quite sit right, I suppose. Um, but I think in, in in what it's trying to achieve for the character, this you know the central character of of the show, which kind of really is is what the whole thing is about, isn't it? I know that people like to say, well, these other characters, like you know, we talk about Alice and we talk about Zoe, and 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 and, and yeah, again, the optics of it don't look good, but really, this is a show about. Luther and that's fine. You're allowed to write shows that are just about the central character and have other characters before them. So it doesn't look good from a real world perspective, but this is not the real world, it's drama. So that's where I stand on it. It's one of those things and things go in and out of relevance here. Like uh women dying is, you know, a perennial thing. So this this conversation always happens. But you see there's other aspects like the military stuff in episode two, in some years, in Britain at least, uh this would feel less I think people would take less issue with anything in it because it would feel less relevant because, it's, you know, there are cycles of how important these things feel. So being able to watch a show in a vacuum, I think, cycles through depending on what people are finding an issue or big in society in a given day. But the treatment of women in narrative is a constant thing. And so it's I think it's difficult to kind of watch like this. If we could watch the show in a vacuum where fridging wasn't a normal thing uh, and women were centered in narratives more than men it would feel very different to loads of viewers and there'd be more of that ability to kind of watch the show context con- without context or like in a vacuum in that way for the narrative to work like that but of course <laughs> we've, we don't live in that world we live in a world with fridging's galore and so uh the way we perceive it is the way we perceive it and i think it's kind of compounded because you can see Alice, like Tom has talked about, being kind of portrayed in this, um, in a way, not probing her interiority a lot of the time. So there's that aspect. And then Z- Zoe is, you know, it's a classic fridging thing. She's killed in a big surprise, and then that propels the Ian and uh, Luther narrative uh, for the finale. And so that's that's all about them. And so I can see how that kind of compounds into, I don't know how women are treated in the next few series of the show. I'll be very interested uh, to see, actually. But I can certainly see why some viewers, you know, will come to this differently. Also, I guess this sort of ties in with, like, the larger discourse around fridging. But it feels like a bit of um, a easy answer to the question of, like, how does this guy deal with um, his wife sort of falling out of love with him? And it's like, to me, it would have posed more interesting narrative challenges to have... John Luther, who to me seems to have a lot of, like, attachment issues and things of that nature. And how does he sort of grow and mature by, you know, Zoe and Mark are together. But instead, it's she's taken out of the picture and it's sort of the question is cut short in a way and it turns into a different question, which, I mean, it is what it is. Like, the Cross chose to do what he did. Um, I just find it less interesting. Yeah. I think the issue... Surprise deaths are tend to be so effective in the moment because it's such a surprise. You've taken a card out of... You've changed the state of play by removing a character. Uh, so they're so shocking and, like, effective in that way in the moment. They, like, make a huge impact. But, the yeah, you've taken a card out of the deck. Um, and so you've limited what hands you can play uh, later on, which is... It, it's a big deal of its own, yeah. Of course, you've propelled some new things. Like, you've put Mark and John in new states to evolve new things out of their characters. But, again, that's the <laughs> classic fridging thing is you've opened up possibilities for the men and you've closed off uh, them for the women. What do we make of the, the use of um, Breathe Me by Sia? Because I've had, I've seen um, and totally understand why very differing opinions on this. And I don't mean Sia in, in the sense that, you know, like from our perspective now, I mean, I just mean the song, Breathe Me. Um, because even at the time, it was a, it was a very um, overplayed song that a lot of people felt was... Um, I've I've seen people's uh, many people's opinions of it were that um, it was almost like uh, like cheesy in the, in, the, in the way that you know the X Factor would use uh, yeah just a generally heartbreaking depressing song uh, how how well do you think it fit how well do you think it worked that's another thing I think it really depends on when you're watching the episode and like where you're from as well um, 
the song is going to have loads of baggage for some people and for others it's not like for me when muses cover a feeling good started playing at the end of i forget which episode that was but i was in mm, yeah oh that's an awesome moment yeah i love that song but that's like i listened to that cover a trillion times <laughs> when i was like 13 and so i was kind of amused in the moment just to hear like oh it's that you know it's it's a to, for me it's a very overplayed song it's and yeah music dates itself interestingly like hearing muse in any in anything is going to kind of amuse <laughs> amuse me off the bat now just because of kind of the perception i have of them now with, with the track at the end of the episode five yeah i think it had less cultural baggage for me than it might have for you or for people in britain yeah i don't think it, it, it worked i don't think it sat very well even then even at the time um and at, as a track it is it is it feels a bit um it's sort of like one of the it's, it's sort of like a like a poem written by like a, a teenager where it's yeah, like you, yeah. you can you can like you can see the you can see the feeling in it and you can see that this has come from you know a place of and I can understand it but it it just it doesn't really do anything so it just it, it feel it feels a little bit out of place um but I think that you know it doesn't it doesn't destroy the scene I think that elder elder plays that moment of shock and grief brilliantly you know now they could end episodes or the movie or whatever with uh idris's own tracks <laughs> they've got that option now. Yeah. <laughs> you know i actually think that um there's a, a a musical um i haven't got musical vocabulary there's there's like a, a, a musical thing um theme motif motif is probably the best word to use yeah um that lb uses uh in the title track and i do actually think that he was secretly hoping like he was secretly gunning for that to be like a character theme <laughs> i i don't I, I don't know if the movie's the last thing or if they want to make more movies or more because i've seen so many weird headlines over the years of what even the movie is but yeah I, I i hope one of his songs makes it into it uh i hope that it is the last thing but i wouldn't trust that it is i think that um i i think that El elba's gonna bully cross into writing luther for the rest of his life it might be one of those things like sherlock where like it ends for a while but there's this kind of hazy thing of everyone involved kind of says we'll probably do more one day just not yet or at least idris will be saying that <laughs> i don't know what <laughs> yeah that's how it's been for the, for the for the last few years yeah yeah <laughs> it's 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 funny because I, I i keep up with with what cross and and what elba are, are saying and yeah. cross every time the show ends from like season three cross will always say oh you know i'm just kind of i'm just gonna leave it for a bit and, and elba's constantly like <laughs> Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll get straight back on it, and we're definitely going to be making more. And Cross, it, it's always come across to me as, as though um, Cross just wants to leave, <laughs> like he wants out of Luther, and Elba's always bullying him back, into, <laughs> back into it. And Cross is Cross is just like a like a like a like a weakling writer who will just eventually cave. Yeah, I love. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm reading way too much into their dynamic now, but I just love the thought of um, Idris showing up at. He'll, uh, Idris showing up at Cross's house or something, <laughs> the way he shows up at, you know, a suspect or at Alice's place and <laughs> swanning around the place and kind of making guarded threats and observations to In costume. bully him into writing more Luther. <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's the vibe I feel from their relationship. Yeah, it's the impression I've always gotten from the, from their interviews. Cross, Cross always seems a little bit uh, disinterested in continuing Luther every time the show ends. And, and Albert, as soon as a, a, a season comes out, uh, there's always a hiatus and he's always... Always uh, <laughs> suggesting that he wants to be picking at it again and again and again. I love this. It, it's it's really not something like when I I haven't seen Sherlock yet, but when I like see Benedict and Martin talk about it, it's particularly with Martin. It's much more of a thing where they they even seem resentful of its success, you know, in some <laughs> yeah. in some ways. And so for, to have the complete opposite an actor going, yeah, hell yes, let's make more ASAP, you know, and for it to be a huge actor, like a very successful, very famous, very beloved actor in Idris Elba. It's just so endearing uh, that he loves the show and the character so much. Are we ready to talk the finale? Yeah, let's do it. Yes. So the final episode, such a boring note to start on, but it interests me that it's not like super long. Like I've, I've, I assume the show earns the success later to have like extended finales, uh, but a lot of the finale actually feels quite clipped to me. There's even a point where I feel like a scene was maybe outright removed. Um, so it interests me that in this first se se series, uh, the show hadn't become big enough yet to kind of have the sway where they can demand more episodes or something. Even Idris himself, well known from The Wire and from a lot of other work he'd done at this point, but he's not the, like he was cast as like a minor character in the Marvel movies um, a couple of years before this, I think. He wasn't yet at that stage where now if he gets cast in something, he'll be the lead of a franchise or whatever. He's hugely famous now. Uh, so it kind of interests me this first finale. I don't know how it is for the later ones, but it's, you know, a regular length. 
um, even though I think there's quite a lot of story in here that could have done with even more time. Yeah, the the, the, the scene that you feel that was cut was was that the one with um, McGann? Exactly. Where they just they 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 yeah, and they and both Luther and Alice pull McGann out, and and McGann has his little freak out, and then Luther says, "I didn't do it," and then and then McGann's like, "Oh, okay." And they just kind of and they just kind of swiftly move on from that, and McGann believes him. It's the kind of thing you feel in scripts where they just have to cut things out because I feel like a very juicy dialogue scene could have happened there with how they turn McGann's mind, how they turn Mark's mind, and convince him. Because I feel like that would have been really dramatically interesting, but instead we just skip from yeah, McGann's on their side now. Given Cross's style, I, I do believe there probably is a, a long. Uh, th- like three-way dialogue between Alice Luther and McGann about uh, Alice Luther and Mark about uh, you know persuading him. I'm sure that that existed. Yeah. Tom, do you do you feel what we're saying there? Does the episode feel fast to you? Do you feel like uh, it's kind of clipped with with missing some of the beats like that, or what do you think? Yeah, it felt slightly abridged. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. I would say, regardless of it feeling as though it could have done with an extra. 10 to 15 minutes or so it is very successful i think in achieving most of the things that it is that it is seeking to achieve um it's very fast very very fast paced um it doesn't stop and not in a um not in a way that you can't keep up with i think it's fast paced in a it's 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 luther committing crime which is really really interesting it's, it's luther kind of stooping to the levels of the criminals um and really enjoying it as well he's really getting off on it so it's kind of like a heist episode in a way um that whole stuff with uh luther and alice putting on masks and going to yeah um freak out shank and and steal back the whatever it is that they're stealing and that that, that whole stuff is great there's it's it's um you know uh doctor who thing again where it's not only in this episode it has, happens in loads of them actually but you know that 2008 uh davros big crossover one where he's like you make your companions into weapons doctor you know you mutilate them into children of time that do evil and violence in your name i feel that kind of sense with uh mark and ripley uh, in this episode where it's like luther is a sun that burns so bright that these people are kind of caught up in his whirlwind and i'm mixing metaphors <laughs> but th- they change because of him and you know they do certain things you can see his unsavory because of the effect he's had on them or the influence he's had on him. Like we have Ripley, who's like the by the books cop in a lot of ways, and he help he, he stops that he thwarts the snipers, you know, from what they're trying to do. And of course, Mark, yeah, like we've talked about, he gets beguiled into going along with Alice and Luther's plot. Yeah, and and what's he doing for them really? He's you know he's he's damaging them. Um, Without Luther doing the things that, I mean, what what need is there for them to do the things that they do, that they do to help, uh, other than to clear Luther's name and prevent him from? Yeah, it's to help him. Yeah, going down for, and it, and it only helps him, and in fact, it damages them because it, it it causes Ripley, albeit temporary, problems in his career. Um, and for McGann, it it causes him. It it has like this this um run on effect of him kind of committing murder and then being implicated in this murder case now that that the season one ends on so he, he all he's doing really is damaging all of these other people around him it's interesting that ripley's behavior is so uncharacteristic there that it's what really shank really notices that and that really rankles him like this isn't i you know i know you this isn't you why are you acting in this way what how does this make any sense uh it's interesting that for shank how Ripley acts in the wake of Luther is, is such a huge issue. Yeah, Schenk is another one of those Zoe Alice characters, I think, who's a great judge of character. Um and is and is is literally a judge of character in the sense that they will they will read you, the viewer, a verdict on this character. Um and also not yield to Luther ever, really. I think the only other person that, that doesn't yield to Luther is Alice. Yeah, so Schenk is one of the only characters who does not um bow to luther in any, in any sense he doesn't he doesn't kind of step step aside for him in in the, in the same way that alice doesn't um they neither of them move aside for him they they are they're happy to be that they are equal to him in different ways um there's this interview with uh mcgann where mcgann says that uh luther is uh, he calls luther an alpha male by it's 2010 and says that um every character uh is yields to luther 
but that's not true of, of Alison or, or Shank, no. He's a modern hero, John Luther, and a real mess, a dangerous character, and an alpha male, and, and everybody else has to, you know, both his colleagues, his boss, everybody else has to, in the end, try and fit in around him. That was interesting comments from McGann. What do you think of Teller's top two detectives <laughs> being like corrupt uh, criminals at this point? <laughs> She doesn't steer a great ship. No, it's funny, isn't it? Because she's clearly very emotionally intelligent as a, as a person, but as a as a as, as you know the boss of of a, of a crime unit, she's constantly making these really, really, really terrible calls. Um, she has this great uh, meltdown moment with Ian in this episode, uh, where she she finally breaks um, this character that's been steadfast for so long. Um, and she she if she finally admits to herself she just should have heeded the you know he's he's a loose cannon he's a maverick everything that that she was being told in episode one and took him back on anyway she she's making these really poor um, emotionally led decisions in a similar way to Luther I suppose um, Saskia Reeves who plays her uh, has uh, says that she had a uh, cool take on her where she said that she wanted to play the woman rather than the boss Saskia. I think sort of individuated a really tough part. The part of the boss in, in cop dramas, and she kind of brings a sort of willfulness and also a humor, a quirkiness. She really wanted to play the woman as opposed to the boss. Uh, and I think that's exactly what she does. Tom, what's your take on Ripley? I see him as a slightly comic figure. Like, cause okay, you say that um, Teller's top two detectives are sort of, they're both corrupt. And then you wonder, well, what if Justin Ripley was the the head honcho and, and the main character of the show? And I just imagine a show about, like, saving cats from trees and <laughs> sort of just really earnest, like, <laughs> delivering cookies from door to door. And, in fact, there was that scene in, in what I'm going to call the Nicola Walker episode because that's what it is to me. There's the end where, like, it's the most tense thing I've ever seen in a TV show and, like, they're waiting for when is Justin Ripley going to show up and Luther literally says, like, Justin, where are you? And I'm literally picturing him, like, <laughs> he sees an old lady crossing the street and he's like, oh, hang on, I have to I have to sort this out. And then he gets out and then, like, helps her, picks up her groceries. Um, and, yeah, he is, like, a Robin figure and I guess there's an interesting tension of, like, how much of Luther's habits is he going to pick up um, and do we want him to pick up Luther's habits? Um... I do, from what I, I've only seen series two, he does stick around, but um, it's, I guess like, it's a fairly, it is just such an innocent, earnest character and the, the actor does a good job of bringing that to life, I think. I don't know, it's like, I'm not sure, like the other supporting characters, I'm not sure if I can imagine Justin Ripley having like a home life. <laughs> at, at most, I can imagine him maybe like getting a bit bullied at school, like because of his such a strong moral centre. Um, but... He doesn't set my teeth on edge like Ian Reid does, so I guess I like him. He Another comic note uh, <laughs> with the cops around Luther, is, and again, it's the comic book logic kind of thing, but the fact it's Luther's own unit investigating Luther as a wife killer here is so funny to me. Like, it's, <laughs> it's like there's, a, there's an issue of are we going to put his best friend on it or are we going to put his other friend on it? Like, is it going to be Ian or Ripley? Why not just not a friend? Why not someone else to deal with? The, the, the stereotypical angry superintendent storms in and he's like, oh, which, which one of you is... is <laughs> and it ends up just landing on Ripley when it could have been either one of them. It, what, what difference did it really make? Yeah, I, I understand the... I understand the, the storytelling nature of that. I mean, what else is Cross to do? But I, <laughs> it's very funny. It plays, it, pl it plays in a very funny way, unintentionally. Ripley being uncharacteristically not Boy Scout in thwarting the snipers is what Shank really fixates on. And he's like, but you're Ripley. You know, why would you do something like that? It makes no sense to me. And that's part of his pathway into his suspicions going down the right track. So it's even the characters in the universe perceive Ripley in like this trope uh, Robin kind of way. Um, you, you've, have you, you've listened to the unit audios, right? Neo or Tyler, have uh, either of you done, done this? <laughs> yeah, I've, some of them. Um, and have you heard the, the Justin Ripley's performance in that? And how does it compare <laughs> to this? It's, well, he plays a very, um, military figure. He plays like the cool, uh, 
kind of alpha male um, military guy, which is a funny kind of contrast. It says a lot about the relationship between TV and audio as a medium, that one, the, the, the alpha in audio is like the, the bottom feeder on TV. <laughs> yeah. We know him as well because um, this actor, the Justin Ripley actor gets clowned on because there's this stock image of him with like his fists raised and it looks a bit silly that's been used in a trillion Big Finish covers because he's in a trillion audios and they reuse their stock images constantly. Just look at the McGann faces. You know, they're at the point with McGann where they're photoshopping different hair on different faces just to try and make new variations of him. Um, so Ripley's, he kind of makes me laugh just in appearance because I've seen him in this dumb pose a zillion times on CDs. Uh, but he's also in Doctor Who itself in the uh, in Series 12 of Jodie Whittaker's stuff when he was also like an alpha kind of guy. He was in that, he, uh, he had a husband that was an astronaut and he was like this former cop because um, him and Yaz like have an exchange, like are we still cops? Um, and he's former and he's doing like a bad job as a security guard because he's way too alpha for the job. So it's funny, <laughs> all the first things I saw this actor in were him being like an alpha male and then I've spun back to 2010 and he's playing like the <laughs> the little minor goody two-shoes to um, Idris Elba. So yeah, that's been fun for me. Do we like the play with uh, McGann being on Luther's side and doing the switcheroos with the diamonds inside of the police office? Uh, and then that's like the the play with um, getting one over Ian. Well, what do we think of that stuff? It's a bit comic, isn't it? It's uh, there's, it, it doesn't feel much like drama. Uh, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I think it is even actually played in that way at, at points. Um, because I think everything that Mark does is played slightly ironically, slightly, um, yeah. as in, you know, the, the, this guy in this, in this world, isn't it funny? I don't know. I, I think it's, it's something that is necessary for, you know, the, the, is it, it's like a plot driving thing. Um, I enjoy it. I think it's a great scene. I think it's a, it's quite tense and it's quite, it's quite comical. It's fun to see Mark in a scene, like in an environment like that, <laughs> playing with in the evidence room. Yeah. It's, Again, it's like I, I wish Zoe didn't have to die to propel how Mark is used in the finale. Um, but I think there is kind of a delight in watching him be like an accessory to crime because he's, he's such a, a kind of pitiable, normal man that to pull him into this wacky criminal cop world is is, is a delight. It's weird because it is it is like the Bilbo Baggins thing of like this really meek yeah. guy and he gets pulled into an adventure. But then you also remember that like his love has just been murdered. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's weird that like his life starts to become exciting at that point. Like he's just a man in search of a tragic backstory. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Mark gets some fun stuff to do, and I guess you know more McGann having fun is can't be a bad thing. I think the ending of the episode is such a big thing to I, I you know I brought up uh, the Davros thing kind of jokingly, but I think that you fashion ordinary people into weapons things. I think it's a real it's like the Finale's literally playing on that beat, the very last scene of it, with uh, Mark and, and the gun and the shotgun. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think there is that actual critique of Luther. It's it's through the conduit of how he's affected these other people. Like, Zoe is dead. Well, she's dead because of Mark, but not, she's dead because of Ian, of course. Um, I'm not victim bl- blaming Luther for his wife's death, but of course he's very ensnared in all that. Um and so Luther's kind of wreaked havoc on this figure of Mark. Uh, he's infected him with these problems and this shifting morality. So yeah, I think I think there is a critique of Luther as a policeman very much. He he kind of you could see him as pulling people down rather than raising anyone up or just maintaining the status quo. Yeah, and like I say, not even catching the villains. Yeah, you know, it's, so he he doesn't catch Alice. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't catch Graham. Um, he doesn't catch the American guy. So in all of these instances, it's, it's his own, uh, emotional attachment that leads him to, to not even be able to do his job, let alone to help people. Tom, I'm very interested what you think of the, the final scene, the railway scene, the Mark with the shotgun scene. I like, I like the sort of, um, the trifecta, um, set that is established, you know, as the status quo at the end of this series. It, make, it makes me want to watch series two, basically. It's another thing where, like, Ian is a background character and then he isn't, and Zoe dies unexpectedly, and the Madsen plot thread is pulled early. Mark 
being like the focus of like the last scene of the first series i never would have pegged that like he very much seemed a comic figure to me in the earlier episodes uh so that's an interesting kind of cross thing to do i think is playing around with your expectations of character prominence and the fact that alice even gives mark a vote at all kind of i think yeah. it's a interesting implicit expression of her growth that i sort of found more believable than maybe some of her other sort of um growths throughout the series but yeah i think she initially mark is just pure like cat playing with mouse but like you know can like can happen with human to cat or human to mouse i think she gets some sort of interest in him as a pet um as things go on i, I mean he gets a uh, post zoe's death he's a more complicated and interesting figure to her um certainly so yeah i think her shifting relationship with him is is a, is a kind of note as well him in his little purple scarf at the end. <laughs> what did we think of the fact that it was McGann, it was Mark who chose to kill kill Ian? Um, and although it was Alice who shot him, it was Mark's call. It's, uh, I, it's I mean, it's a character changing. It's good. It's active. Um, well, it's interesting because Tom brought up well how Mark is the passive type, even how he talks. I don't know he doesn't literally use the gun here, but he effectively shoots Ian. like it's his choice he, he knows what alice will do she's not playing around here it's i i mean i love paul mcgann so i like making him such a focus of the finale but i also think it's kind of like uh episode four the nicola walker one in we've kind of removed luther from the climax but it's interesting here because he's right there so he's witnessing how he's affected people even though he's not actually doing the actions right at the very end there uh i i like that i think it's interesting for him to observe what he's kind of wrought or, you know, how he's involved in these people, what a mess he's made of their lives. Like I know McGann in that interview we mentioned earlier, he, he calls Luther a real mess. And so I think it's interesting for Luther to have to wallow in the mess he's made of Mark, Mark's life there at the end. And the song choice is <laughs> very appropriate. Perhaps it's not, you know, the, the theme, which is Paradise Circus, but it, but it is something to to think about frequently when you when you're watching this show the line i'm just a soul whose intentions were good yeah it's it's very yeah clicked in i really love how playful ruth wilson is in that final scene there's just her physicality like there's a way she spins around and it's so like girlish and <laughs> playful it's it's uh, so fantastic she's having such fun and <laughs> it's such an emotionally devastating situation for ian for luther and for mark and She's just kind of joyous in what a mess this is. It's so fascinating to her. The world must be so dull for her. It's like she says to Luther in episode one, criminals must be so monotonous and dull for you. I think the world in general is like that for her, but she's found a lovely little emotional criminal mess here. And I, I think it really appeals to her. <laughs> it's, it's literally like a game. Like she's saying we're 50, 50. We like, we need a tiebreaker vote. Like it's, it's, it's all so gamified for her. Yeah, it's it's sort of it's almost hard not to fall in love with Alice, isn't it? It's a bit like uh, Missy. It's a very it's a very um, like a, a straight male fantasy thing that both it's interesting both Moffat and um, Cross do this, but it is hard not to uh, just le- just sort of let yourself smile at her, her really enjoying this. And yeah, I, re- I remember specifically that spin that you're talking about where she just, she spins it and, and grins and she's so gleeful and and yeah, it's it's just great. She's Wilson is great. She's brilliant. I think it kind of invites you into the show and the tone of the show that like it's very serious like it's a huge emotional mess um it's real it's real negativity and it's real stress for the normal characters but i think it kind of lets you into enjoying the show to have like she's evil and psychopathic but to have a character there actually having fun with it too it's like these cop shows aren't made for you just to frown at and you know shake your head and be sad over like people are getting enjoyment out of cases being solved and criminals being caught and dramas being had melodrama between cops and their ex-wives and things i feel like it's like you were talking earlier about how she kind of speaks to the audience but i think she 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 almost feels like the audience identification figure sometimes for me like in that scene i think definitely like i feel sorry for luther but like she's having fun with the high drama of this and i think to an extent that's the viewer probably is too or a certain type of viewer anyway is there any closing things uh, you want to put in before we call it? No, not off the top of my head, no. No, I think I've, I've said everything I needed to say about season one. All right, next is series two.
How do we feel about that? And I, all my favorite bits that I can remember were from series two. So I'm looking forward to rewatching it. Brilliant. And that wraps up our discussion of the first series of Luther, the 2010 series. Thank you for listening in. And please chime in with your thoughts on this first series and or Luther in general, the show in general, uh, the characters of the show, Neil Cross, any of the topics we discussed or anything that you think we might have left out. Cheers for listening.